Section 1 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, and Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson. In front of the landscape. Plunging and laboring on in the tide of visions, dolorous and dear, forward I pushed my way as amid waste waters stretching around, through whose eddies there glimmered the customed landscape yonder and near. Blotted to feeble mist, and the coombe and the upland foliage crowned ancient chalk pit milestone rills in the grass flat stroked by the light seemed but a ghost-like gauze and no substantial meadow or mound what were the infinite spectacles bulking foremost under my sight hindering me to discern my paced advancement, lengthening to miles. What were the recreations killing the daytime as by the night? Oh, they were speechful faces, gazing insistent, some as with smiles, some as with slow-born tears, that brinily trundled over the wrecked cheeks that were fair in their flush time, ash now with anguish, harrowed by wiles. Yes, I could see them, feel them, hear them, address them, halo bedecked, and, alas, onwards, shaken by fierce unreason, rigid in hate, smitten by years-long wryness born of misprision, dreaded suspect. Then there would breast me shining sights, sweet seasons further in date, instruments of strings with the tenderest passion vibrant beside lamps long extinguished robes cheeks eyes with the earth's crust now corporate also there rose a headland of hoary aspect gnawed by the tide frilled by the nim of the morning as two friends stood there guilelessly glad, wherefore they knew not, touched by the fringe of an ecstasy scantly descried. Later images, too, did the day unfurl me, shadowed and sad, clay cadavers of those who had shared in the dramas, laid now at ease, passions all spent chiefest the one of the broad brow sepulchre clad so did beset me scenes miscalled of the bygone over the lees past the clump and down to where lay the beheld ones yea as the rhyme sung by the sea swell so in their pleading dumbness captured me these. For their lost revisiting manifestations in their own time, much had I slighted, caring not for their purport, seeing behind things more coveted, reckoned the better worth calling sweet, sad, sublime. Thus do they now show hourly before the intenser stare of the mind, 
as they were ghosts, avenging their slights by my bypassed, body-borne eyes. Show, too, with fuller translation than rested upon them as living kind. Hence wag the tongues of the passing people, saying in their surmise, Ah, whose is this dull form that perambulates, seeing not round him that looms, whithersoever his footsteps turn in his fairings, save a few tombs. End of section one. This recording is in the public domain. Section 2 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Channel Firing That night your great guns, unawares, shook all our coffins as we lay, and broke the chancel window squares, we thought it was the judgment day. And sat upright. While drearysome arose the howl of wakened hounds, the mouse let fall the altar crumb, the worms drew back into the mounds. The glebe cow drooled, till God called, No! It's gunnery practice out at sea, just as before you went below. The world is as it used to be. All nations striving strong to make red war yet redder, Mad as hatters, they do no more for Christ's sake than you who are helpless in such matters. That this is not the judgment hour, for some of them's a blessed thing, for if it were, they'd have to scour hell's floor for so much threatening. Ha <laughs> ha! It will be warmer when I blow the trumpet, if indeed I ever do, for you are men and rest eternal sorely need. So down we lay again. I wonder, will the world ever saner be, said one, than when he sent us under in our indifferent century. And many a skeleton shook his head. Instead of preaching forty year, my neighbor Parson thirdly said, I wish I had stuck to pipes and beer. Again the guns disturbed the hour, roaring their readiness to avenge, as far inland as Stoughton Tower, and Camelot, and starlit Stonehenge. April 1914 End of section 2 This recording is in the public domain Section 3 Of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries And Miscellaneous Pieces By Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org By John Burlinson The Convergence of the Twain Lines on the Loss of the Titanic 1. In a solitude of the sea, deep from human vanity, and the pride of life that planned her, stilly couches she. 2. Steel chambers Late the pyres of her salamandrine fires, Cold currents thrid, and turn to rhythmic tidal lyres. 3. Over the mirrors meant to glass the opulent, The sea-worm crawls, grotesque, slimed, dumb, indifferent for jewels in joy designed to ravish the sensuous mind lie lightless all their sparkles bleared and black and blind five Dim moon-eyed fishes near Gaze at the gilded gear And query, What does this vaingloriousness down here? 
six. Well, while was fashioning this creature of cleaving wing, the imminent will that stirs and urges everything. Seven. Prepared a sinister mate for her, so gaily great, a shape of ice, for the time far and dissociate. Eight. And as the smart ship grew in stature, grace, and hue, in shadowy silent distance grew the iceberg too. Nine. Alien they seemed to be, no mortal eye could see the intimate welding of their later history. Ten. Or sign that they were bent by paths coincident on being anon twin halves of one august event. Eleven. Till the spinner of the years said now, and each one hears, and consummation comes, and jars two hemispheres. End of section three. This recording is in the public domain. Section 4 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. The Ghost of the Past We two kept house, the past and I, the past and I. I tended while it hovered nigh, leaving me never alone. It was a spectral housekeeping, where fell no jarring tone, as strange as still a housekeeping, as ever has been known. As daily I went up the stair, and down the stair, I did not mind the bygone there, the present ones to me. Its moving me companionship I wished might ever be. There was in that companionship something of ecstasy. It dwelt with me just as it was, just as it was, when first its prospects gave me pause in wayward wanderings. Before the years had torn old troth, as they tear all sweet things, Before gaunt griefs had torn old troth, and dulled old rapturings. And then its form began to fade, began to fade, Its gentle echoes faintlier played at eaves upon my ear, Than when the autumn's look embrowned the lonely chambers here, The autumn's settling shades embrowned nooks that it haunted near. And so with time my vision less, yea, less and less, makes of that past my housemistress. It dwindles in my eye, it looms a far-off skeleton, and not a comrade nigh. A fitful far-off skeleton, dimming as days draw by. End of section 4. This recording is in the public domain. Section 5 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. After the Visit To F. E. D. Come again to the place, where your presence was as a leaf that skims down a drouthy way, whose ascent bedims the bloom on the fairer's face. Come again with the feet that were light on the green as a thistle-down ball, and those mute ministrations to one and to all, beyond a man's saying sweet. Until then the faint scent of the bordering flowers swam unheeded away, and I marked not the charm in the changes of day as the cloud colours came and went. Through the dark corridors your walk was so soundless, I did not know your form from a phantoms of long ago, set to pass on the ancient floors. Till you drew from the shade, and I saw the large, luminous, living eyes regard me in fixed, inquiring wise, as those of a soul that wait, 
scarce consciously the eternal question of what life was and why we were there and by whose strange laws that which mattered most could not be end of section five this recording is in the public domain section six of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by john burlinson to meet or otherwise whether to sally and see thee girl of my dreams or whether to stay and see thee not how vast the difference seems of yea from nay just now yet this same sun will slant its beams at no far day on our two mounds and then what will the difference weigh yet i will see thee maiden dear and make the most i can of what remains to us amid this break cimmerian through which we grope and from whose thorns we ache while still we scan round our frail faltering progress for some path or plan by briefest meeting something sure is won it will have been nor god nor demon can undo the done unsight the scene make muted music be as unbegun though things terrene groan in their bondage till oblivion supervene so to the one long sweeping symphony from times remote till now of human tenderness shall we supply one note small and untraced yet that will ever be somewhere afloat amid the spheres as part of sick life's antidote end of section six this recording is in the public domain section seven of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by john burlinson the difference one sinking down by the gate i discerned the thin moon and a blackbird tries over old airs in the pine but the moon is a sorry one sad the bird's tune for this spot is unknown to that heartmate of mine. Two. Did my heartmate but haunt here at times such as now, the song would be joyous and cheerful the moon. But she will see never this gate, path, or bough nor i find a joy in the scene or the tune end of section seven this recording is in the public domain section eight of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by sonia the sun on the bookcase Student's Love Song Once more the cauldron of the sun smears the bookcase with winy red, And here my pages, and there my bed, and the apple tree shadows travel along. Soon their intangible track will be run, and dusk grow strong, and they be fled. Yes, now the boiling ball is gone, and I have wasted another day. But wasted, wasted do I say? Is it a waste to have imagined one beyond the hills there, who anon my great deeds done will be mine alway? End of section eight. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 9 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. When I Set Out for Lyoness When I set out for Lyoness, a hundred miles away, the rhyme was on the spray, and starlight lit my lonesomeness, when I set out for Lyoness, a hundred miles away. What would be chance at Lyoness while I should sojourn there, no prophet durst declare. Nor did the wisest wizard guess what would be chance at Lyoness while I should sojourn there. When I came back from Lyoness with magic in my eyes, none managed to surmise what meant my godlike gloriousness when I came back from Lyoness with magic in my eyes. End of section 9. This recording is in the public domain. Section 10 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson. A Thunderstorm in Town, A Reminiscence she wore a new terracotta dress and we stayed because of the pelting storm within the handsome's dry recess though the horse had stopped yea motionless we sat on snug and warm then the downpour ceased to my sharp sad pain and the glass that had screened our forms before flew up, and out she sprang to her door. I should have kissed her if the rain had lasted a minute more. End of section 10 This recording is in the public domain. Section 11 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson. The Torn Letter 1. I tore your letter into strips no bigger than the airy feathers that ducks preen out in changing weathers upon the shifting ripple tips. 2. In darkness on my bed alone I seem to see you in a vision, And hear you say, Why this derision Of one drawn to you, though unknown? 3. Yes, Eve's quick mood had run its course, The night had cooled my hasty madness, I suffered a regretful sadness Which deepened into real remorse. For, I thought what pensive patient days a soul must know of grain so tender, how much of good must grace the sender of such sweet words in such bright phrase. 5. Uprising then, as things unpriced, I sought each fragment patched and mended. The midnight whitened ere I had ended, and gathered words I had sacrificed. 6. But some, alas, of those I threw were past my search, destroyed forever. They were your name and place, and never did I regain those clues to you. 7. I learnt I had missed by rash unheed my track, that so the will decided in life, death, we should be divided, and at the sense I ached indeed. 8. That ache for you, born long ago, throbs on. I never could outgrow it, what a revenge did you but know it? But that, thank God, you do not know. 
End of section 11. This recording is in the public domain. Section 12 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Beyond the Last Lamp, near Tooting Common. 1. While rain with eve in partnership descended darkly, drip, 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 beyond the last lone lamp I passed, walking slowly, whispering sadly, two linked loiterers, one downcast. Some heavy thought constrained each face and blinded them to time and place. 2. The pair seemed lovers, yet absorbed in mental scenes no longer orbed by love's young rays. Each countenance, as it slowly, as it sadly, caught the lamplight's yellow glance, held in suspense a misery at things which had been or might be. 3. When I retrod that watery way, some hours beyond the droop of day, still I found pacing there the twain, just as slowly just as sadly, heedless of the night and rain. One could but wonder who they were, and what wild woe detained them there. 4. Though thirty years of blur and blot have slid since I beheld that spot, and saw in curious converse there, moving slowly, moving sadly, that mysterious tragic pair, its olden look may linger on, all but the couple they have gone. 5. Whither? Who knows indeed? And yet to me, when nights are weird and wet, without those comrades there at tryst, creeping slowly, creeping sadly, that lone lane does not exist. There they seem brooding on their pain, and will, while such a lane remain. End of section 12. This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. The Face at the Casement If ever joy leave an abiding sting of sorrow, so befell it on the morrow of that May Eve. The travelled sun dropped to the northwest, lo, and lower the pony's trot grew slower and then we stopped this cozy house just by i must call at for a minute a sick man lies within it who soon will die he wished to marry me so i am bound when i drive near him to inquire if but to cheer him how he may be a message was sent in and wordlessly we waited, till someone came and stated the bulletin, and that the sufferer said, for her call no words could thank her, as his angel he must rank her, till life's spark fled. Slowly we drove away, when I turned my head, although not called, why so I turned I know not even to this day, and lo, there in my view, pressed against an upper lattice, was a white face, gazing at us as we withdrew. And well did I divine it to be the man's there dying, who but lately had been sighing for her pledged mine. Then I deigned a deed of hell. It was done before I knew it. What devil made me do it, I cannot tell. Yes, while he gazed above, I put my arm about her that he might see, nor doubt her my plighted love. The pale face vanished quick, as if blasted from the casement, and my shame and self-abasement began their prick. And they prick on, ceaselessly, for that stab in love's fierce fashion which, unfired by lover's passion, was foreign to me. She smiled at my caress, but why came the soft embowment of her shoulder at that moment, she did not guess. 
Long, long years has he lain in thy garth, O sad Saint Clether. What tears there, bared to weather, will cleanse that stain? Love is long-suffering, brave, sweet, prompt, precious as a jewel. But, oh, true love is cruel, cruel as the grave. End of section 13. This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Lost Love I play my sweet old airs, the airs he knew when our love was true. But he does not balk his determined walk, and passes up the stairs. I sing my songs once more, and presently hear his footstep near, as if it would stay. But he goes his way, and shuts a distant door. So I wait for another morn, and another night, in this soul-sick blight. And I wonder much, as I sit, why such a woman as I was born. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. My spirit will not haunt the mound. My spirit will not haunt the mound above my breast, but travel, memory possessed, to where my tremulous being found life largest, best. My phantom-footed shape will go when nightfall grays, hither and thither along the ways I and another used to know in backward days. And there you'll find me, if a jot you still should care for me and for my curious air. If otherwise, then I shall not, for you, be there. End of section 15 this recording is in the public domain. Section 16 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson. Wessex Heights, 1896. There are some heights in Wessex, shaped as if by a kindly hand for thinking dreaming dying on and at crises when i stand say on ingpen beacon eastward or on will's neck westwardly i seem where i was before my birth and after death may be in the lowlands i have no comrade not even the lone man's friend her who suffereth long and is kind, Accepts what he is too weak to mend. Down there they are dubious and askance, There nobody thinks as I, But mine chains do not clank Where one's next neighbour is the sky. In the towns I am tracked by phantoms Having weird detective ways, shadows of beings who fellowed with myself of earlier days they hang about at places and they say harsh heavy things men with a frigid sneer and women with tart disparagings down there i seem to be false to myself my simple self that was and is not now and I see him watching, wondering, what crass cause can have merged him into such a strange continuator as this, who yet has something in common with himself, my chrysalis. I cannot go to the great grey plain. There's a figure against the moon. Nobody sees it but I and it makes my breast beat out of tune. 
I cannot go to the tall spired town, being barred by the forms now past for everybody but me, in whose long vision they stand there fast. There's a ghost at Yellum Bottom chiding loud at the fall of the night. There's a ghost in Froomside Vale, thin lipped and vague, in a shroud of white. There is one in the railway train whenever I do not want it near. I see its profile against the pane, saying what I would not hear. As for one rare fair woman, I am now but a thought of hers. I enter her mind, and another thought succeeds me that she prefers. Yet my love for her in its fullness she herself even did not know. Well, time cures hearts of tenderness, and now I can let her go. So I am found on Ingpen Beacon, or on Will's Neck to the west, or else on homely Bulborough, or little Pilsden Crest, where men have never cared to haunt, nor women have walked with me, and ghosts then keep their distance, and I know some liberty. End of section 16 this recording is in the public domain. Section 17 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia In Death Divided 1. I shall rot here with those whom in their day you never knew, and alien ones who ere they chill to clay met not my view will in your distant grave place ever neighbour you two no shade of pinnacle or tree or tower while earth endures will fall on my mount and within the hour steal on to yours one robin never haunt our two green covertures three some organ may resound on sunday noons by where you lie some other thrill the pains with other tunes where moulder i no self-same chords compose our common lullaby four the simply cut memorial at my head perhaps may take a gothic form and that above your bed be greek in make no linking symbol show thereon for our tale's sake five and in the monotonous moils of strained hard-run humanity the eternal tie which binds us twain in one no eye will see stretching across the miles that sever you from me end of section 17 this recording is in the public domain section 18 of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Place on the Map 1. I look upon the map that hangs by me, its shires and towns and rivers lined in varnished artistry, and I mark a jutting height colored purple with a margin of blue sea. 2. Twas a day of latter summer, hot and dry, I, even the waves seemed drying as we walked on, she and I, by this spot where, calmly quite, she informed me what would happen by and by. 3. This hanging map depicts the coast and place, and resuscitates therewith our unexpected troublous case, all distinctly to my sight, and her tension, and the aspect of her face. Four. Weeks and weeks we had loved beneath that blazing blue, but she lost the art of reigning, as her eyes today had too. While she told what, as by slight, shot our firmament with rays of ruddy hue. 
5. For the wonder and the wormwood of the whole Was that what in realms of reason would have joyed our double soul Wore a torrid tragic light under order-keeping's rigorous control. 6. So, the map revives her words, the spot, the time, and the thing we found we had to face before the next year's prime. The charted coast stares bright, and its episode comes back in pantomime. End of section 18 this recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Where the Picnic Was Where we made the fire in the summertime Of branch and briar on the hill to the sea I slowly climb through winter mire and scan and trace the forsaken place quite readily now a cold wind blows and the grass is gray but the spot still shows as a burnt circle a and stick ends charred still strew the sword whereon i stand last relic of the band who came that day yes i am here just as last year and the sea breathes brine from its strange straight line up hither the same as when we four came but two have wandered far from this grassy rise into urban roar where no picnics are and one has shut her eyes for evermore end of section nineteen this recording is in the public domain Section 20 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Schreckhorn, with Thoughts of Leslie Stephen, June 1897. Aloof, as if a thing of mood and whim, now that its spare and desolate figure gleams upon my nearing vision, less it seems a looming alpite than a guise of him, who scaled its horn with ventured life and limb, drawn on by vague imaginings, maybe, of semblance to his personality in its quaint glooms, keen lights, and rugged trim. At his last change, when life's dull coils unwind, will he in old love hitherward escape, and the eternal essence of his mind enter this silent adamantine shape, and his slow voicing haunt its slipping snows, when dawn that calls the climber dies them rose. End of section 20. This recording is in the public domain. Section 21 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. A Singer Asleep Algernon Charles Swinburne 1837-1909 to One. In this fair niche above the unslumbering sea That centuries up and down all night, all day From cove to promontory, from nest to bay The fates have fitly bidden That he should be pillowed eternally. Two it was as though a garland of red roses had fallen about the hood of some smug nun when irresponsibly dropped as from the sun in fulth of numbers freaked with musical closes upon victoria's formal middle time his leaves of rhythm and rhyme three on that far morning of a summer day when down a terraced street whose pavements lay glassing the sunshine into my bent eyes, I walked and read with a quick, glad surprise new words in classic guise. For the passionate pages of his earlier years, fraught with hot sighs, sad laughters, kisses, tears, fresh fluted notes, yet from a minstrel who blew them not naively, 
but as one who knew full well why thus he blew. Five. I still can hear the brabble and the roar of those thy tunes, O oh, still one, now passed through that fitful fire of tongues then entered new. Their power is spent like spindrift on this shore, thine swells yet more and more. Six. His singing mistress verily was no other than she the lesbian, she the music mother of all the tribe that feel in melodies, who leapt, love anguished, from the Leucadian steep into the rambling world encircling deep, which hides her where none sees. Seven. And one can hold in the thought that nightly here his phantom may draw down to the water's brim, and hers come up to meet it, as a dim lone shine upon the heaving hydrosphere, and mariners wonder as they traverse near, and knowing of her and him. Eight. One dreams him sighing to her spectral form. O oh, teacher, where lies hid thy burning line? Where are those songs, O oh, poetess divine, whose very arts are love incarnadine? And her smile back, disciple true and warm, sufficient now are thine. Nine. So here, beneath the waking constellations, where the waves peal their everlasting strains, and their dull subterrene reverberations shake him when storms make mountains of their plains, him once their peer in sad improvisations, and deft as wind to cleave their frothy manes. I leave him, while the daylight gleam declines upon the capes and chimes. Bon Church, nineteen ten. End of section twenty one. This recording is in the public domain. Section twenty two of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. A Plaint to Man. When you slowly emerged from the den of time, and gained percipience as you grew, and fleshed you fair out of shapeless slime, wherefore, O oh man, did there come to you the unhappy need of creating me, a form like your own, for praying to? My virtue, power, utility, within my maker must all abide, since none in myself can ever be. One thin as a shape on a lantern slide, shone forth in the dark upon some dim sheet, and by none but its showman vivified. Such a forced device, you may say, is meet for easing a loaded heart at whiles. Man needs to conceive of a mercy seat somewhere above the gloomy aisles of this wailful world, or he could not bear the irk no local hope beguiles. But since I was framed in your first despair, the doing without me has had no play in the minds of men when shadows scare. And now that I dwindle day by day beneath the dayside eyes of seers in a light that will not let me stay, and to-morrow the whole of me disappears, the truth should be told and the fact be faced that had best been faced in earlier years. The fact of life with dependence placed on the human heart's resource alone in brotherhood bonded, close and graced, with loving kindness fully blown, and visioned help unsought, unknown. 1909-10 to 10. End of section 22。section 23 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with miscellaneous pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. God's Funeral 1. I saw a slowly stepping train, lined on the brows, scoop-eyed and bent and hoar, following in files across a twilit plain, a strange and mystic form the foremost bore. 2. And by contagious throbs of thought, or latent knowledge that within me lay, and had already stirred me, 
I was wrought to consciousness of sorrow, even as they. 3. The foreborn shape to my blurred eyes at first seemed manlike, and anon to change to an amorphous cloud of marvellous size, at times endowed with wings of glorious range. 4. And this phantasmal variousness ever possessed it as they drew along, yet throughout all it symboled none the less potency vast and loving kindness strong. 5. Almost before I knew, I bent towards the moving columns without a word. They, growing in bulk and numbers as they went, struck out sick thoughts that could be overheard. 6. O oh, man projected figure, of late imaged as we, thy knell who shall survive. Whence came it we were tempted to create one whom we can no longer keep alive? 7. Framing him jealous, fierce at first, we gave him justice as the ages rolled, will to bless those by circumstance accursed, and long suffering and mercies manifold. 8. And tricked by our own early dream, a need of solace, we grew self deceived, our making soon our maker did we deem, and what we had imagined we believed. 9. Till, in time's stayless stealthy swing, uncompromising rude reality, mangled the monarch of our fashioning, who quavered, sank, and now has ceased to be. 10. So, toward our myth's oblivion, darkling and languid-lipped, we creep and grope, sadlier than those who wept in Babylon, whose Zion was a still abiding hope. 11. How sweet it was in years far hide to start the wheels of day with trustful prayer, to lie down liegely at the eventide and feel a blessed assurance he was there. 12. And who or what shall fill his place? Whither will wanderers turn distracted eyes for some fixed star to stimulate their pace towards the goal of their enterprise? 13. Some in the background then I saw, sweet women, youth, men, all incredulous, who chimed as one. This figure is of straw, this requiem mockery, still he lives to us. 14. I could not prop their faith, and yet many I had known. With all I sympathized, and though struck speechless, I did not forget that what was mourned for, I too one set prized. 15. Still, how to bear such loss I deemed the insistent question for each animate mind, and gazing to my growing sight there seemed a pale yet positive gleam low down behind. 16. Whereof to lift the general night, a certain few who stood aloof had said, See you upon the horizon that small light? swelling somewhat each mourner shook his head seventeen and they composed a crowd of whom some were right good and many nigh the best thus dazed and puzzled twixt the gleam and gloom mechanically i followed with the rest nineteen o eight to nineteen ten end of section twenty three this recording is in the public domain Section 24 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Spectres that Grieve It is not death that harrows us, they lipped. The soundless cell is in itself relief. For life is an unfenced flower, benumbed and nipped at unawares, and at its best but brief. The speakers, sundry phantoms of the gone, had risen like filmy flames of phosphor dye, as if the palest of sheet lightnings shone from the sword near me as from a nether sky. And much surprised was I that, spent and dead, they should not, like the many, be at rest, but stray as apparitions. Hence I said, 
Why, having slipped life, hark you back distressed? We are among the few death sets not free, the hurt, misrepresented names, who come at each year's brink and cry to history to do them justice, or go past them dumb. We are stripped of rights, our shames lie unredressed, our deeds in full anatomy are not shown, our words in morsels merely are expressed on the scriptured page, our motives blurred, unknown. Then all these shaken, slighted visitants sped into the vague, and left me musing there on fames that well might instance what they had said, until the New Year's dawn strode up the air. End of section 24 This recording is in the public domain. Section 25 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia and by John Burlinson. Ah, are you digging on my grave? Ah, are you digging on my grave, my loved one, planting rue? No, yesterday he went to wed one of the brightest wealth had bred cannot hurt him now he said that i should not be true then who is digging on my grave my nearest dearest kin ah uh, no they sit and think what use what good will planting flowers produce no tendance of her mound can loose her spirit from death's gin but someone digs upon my grave my enemy prodding sly nay when she heard you had passed the gate that shuts on all flesh soon or late she thought you no more worth her hate and cares not where you lie then who is digging on my grave say since i have not guessed oh it is i my mistress dear your little dog who still lives near and much i hope my movements here have not disturbed your rest ah yes you dig upon my grave why flashed it not on me that one true heart was left behind? What feeling do we ever find to equal among humankind a dog's fidelity? Mistress, I dug upon your grave to bury a bone, in case I should be hungry near this spot when passing on my daily trot. I am sorry, but I quite forgot it was your resting place. End of section 25 this recording is in the public domain. Section 26 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Satires of Circumstances, in Fifteen Glimpses. 1. At Tea The kettle descants in a cosy drone, and the young wife looks in her husband's face, and then at her guests, and shows in her own her sense that she fills an envied place. And the visiting lady is all abloom, and says there was never so sweet a room. And the happy young housewife does not know that the woman beside her was first his choice, till the fates ordained it could not be so. Betraying nothing in look or voice, the guest sits smiling and sips her tea and he throws her a stray glance yearningly. End of section 26 Section 27 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter 2. In Church and now to God the Father, he ends, and his voice thrills up to the topmost tiles. Each listener chokes as he bows and bends, and emotion pervades the crowded aisles. Then the preacher glides to the vestry door and shuts it, and thinks he is seen no more. The door swings softly ajar meanwhile, and a pupil of his in the Bible class who adores him as one without gloss or guile, sees her idol stand with a satisfied smile, 
and reenact the vestry glass, each pulpit gesture in deft dumb show that had moved the congregation so. End of section 27. This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. 3. By her aunt's grave. Six pence a week, says the girl to her lover. Aunt used to bring me, for she could confide in me alone, she vowed. T'was to cover the cost of her headstone when she died. And that was a year ago, last June. I've not yet fixed it but I must soon. And where is the money now, my dear? Oh, snug in my purse, and was so slow in saving it, eighty weeks or near. Let's spend it, he hints, for she won't know. There's a dance tonight at the load of hay. She passively nods, and they go that way. End of section 28 Section 29 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. 4. In the Room of the Bride Elect Would it had been the man of our wish, sighs her mother, to whom, with vehemence, she, in the wedding dress, the wife to be. Then why were you so mollyish as not to insist on him for me? The mother, amazed, why, dearest one, because you pleaded for this or none. But father and you should have stood out strong. Since then, to my cost, I have lived to find that you were right and that I was wrong. This man is a dole to the one declined. Ah, here he comes with his buttonhole rose. Good God, I must marry him, I suppose. End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain. Section 30 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. 5. At the Watering Place They sit and smoke on the esplanade, the man and his friend, and regard the bay, where the far chalk cliffs to the left displayed Smile sallowly in the decline of day, And saunterers pass with laugh and jest, A handsome couple among the rest. That smart, proud pair, says the man to his friend, Are to marry next week. How little he thinks that dozens of days and nights on end I have stroked her neck, Unhooked the links of her sleeve to get at her upper arm. Well, bliss is an ignorance, What's the harm? End of section 30. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. 6. In the Cemetery. You see those mothers squabbling there? remarks the man of the cemetery. One says in tears, This mine lies here. Another, Nay, mine, you Pharisee. Another, How dare you move my flowers and put your own on this grave of ours? But all their children were laid therein at different times, like sprats in a tin. And then the main drain had to cross and removed the lot some nights ago and pack them away in the general foss with hundreds more, but their folks don't know, and as well cry over a new laid drain as anything else to ease your pain. End of section 31. This recording is in the public domain. Section 32 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. 7. 
outside the window. My stick, he says, and turns in the lane, to the house just left, where the vixen voice comes out with a firelight through the pane, and he sees within that the girl of his choice stands rating her mother with eyes aglare, for something said while he was there. At last I behold her so undraped, thinks the man who had loved her more than himself. My God, tis but nearly I have escaped. My precious porcelain proves a delf. His face has reddened like one ashamed, and he steals off, leaving his stick unclaimed. End of section 32 This recording is in the public domain. Section 33 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. 8. In the Study He enters and, mute on the edge of a chair, sits a thin-faced lady, a stranger there, a type of decayed gentility, and by some small signs he well can guess that she comes to him almost breakfastless. I have called... I hope I do not err. I am looking for a purchaser of some score volumes of the works of eminent divines I own, left by my father, though it irks my patience to offer them. And she smiles, as if necessity were unknown. But the truth of it is that often whiles I have wished, as I am fond of art, to make my rooms a little smart. And lightly still she laughs to him, as if to sell were a mere gay whim, and that, to be frank, Life were indeed to her not vinegar and gall, but fresh and honey-like, and need no household skeleton at all. End of section 33. This recording is in the public domain. Section 34 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson and by Sonia. 9. At the Altar Rail My bride is not coming, alas, says the groom, and the telegram shakes in his hand. I own it was hurried. We met at a dancing room when I went to the cattle show alone, and then next night, where the fountain leaps, and the street of the quarter circle sweeps. Ay, she won me to ask her to be my wife. T'was foolish, perhaps, to forsake the ways of the flaring town for a farmer's life. She agreed, and we fixed it. Now she says, It's sweet of you, dear, to prepare me a nest, but a swift, short, gay life suits me best. What I really am, you have never gleaned. I had eaten the apple ere you were weaned. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia and John Burlinson. 10. In the Nuptial Chamber Oh, that mastering tune! And up in the bed, like a lace-robed phantom, springs the bride. And why, asks the man she had that day wed, with a start, as the band plays on outside? It's the town folk's cheery compliment, because of our marriage, my innocent. Oh, but you don't know, this the passionate air to which my old love waltzed with me. And I swore as we spun that none should share my home, my kisses, till death, save he. And he dominates me and thrills me through, and it's he I embrace while embracing you. End of section 35. This recording is in the public domain. Section 36 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox.org 
by John Burlinson and by Sonia. 11. In the Restaurant But here, if you stay and the child be born, it will pass as your husband's with the rest, while, if we fly, the teeth of scorn will be gleaming at us from east to west, and the child will come as a life despised. I feel an elopement is ill-advised. Oh, you realize not what it is, my dear, to a woman. Daily and hourly alarms, lest the truth should out. How can I stay here, and nightly take him into my arms? Come to the child, no name or fame. Let us go, and face it, and bear the shame. End of section 36 this recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter 12. At the Drapers I stood at the back of the shop, my dear, but you did not perceive me. Well, when they deliver what you were shown, I shall know nothing of it, believe me. And he coughed and coughed as she paled and said, Oh, I didn't see you come in there. Why couldn't you speak? Well, I didn't. I left that you should not notice I'd been there. You were viewing some lovely things, soon required for a widow of latest fashion. And I knew it would upset you to meet the man who had to be cold and ashen, and screwed in a box before they could dress you in the last new note in mourning, as they defined it. So, not to distress you, I left you to your adorning. End of section 37. This recording is in the public domain. Section 38 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. 13. On the Deathbed I'll tell, being past all praying for, then promptly die. He was out at the war, and got some scent of the intimacy that was under way between her and me. And he stole back home, and appeared like a ghost one night, at the very time almost that I reached her house. Well, I shot him dead, and secretly buried him. Nothing was said. The news of the battle came next day. He was scheduled missing. I hurried away, got out there, visited the field, and sent home word that a search revealed he was one of the slain, though, lying alone and stripped, his body had not been known. But she suspected. I lost her love, yea, my hope of earth and of heaven above. My time's now come, and I'll pay the score, though it be burning for evermore. End of section 38. This recording is in the public domain. Section 39 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. 14. Over the coffin. They stand confronting, the coffin between, his wife of old and his wife of late, and the dead man, whose they both had been, seems listening aloof as to things past date. I have called, says the first. Do you marvel or not? In truth, says the second, I do, somewhat. Well, there was a word to be said by me. I divorced that man because of you. It seemed I must do it, boundenly. But now I am older, and tell you true, For life is little, and dead lies he. 
I would I had let alone you two, and both of us, scorning parochial ways, had lived like the wives in the patriarch's days. End of section 39. This recording is in the public domain. Section 40 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. 15. In the Moonlight. O oh, lonely workman, standing there in a dream, why do you stare and stare at her grave as no other grave there were? If your great gaunt eyes so importune her soul by the shine of this corpse cold moon, maybe you'll raise her phantom soon. My fool, it is what I would rather see than all the living folk there be. But alas, there is no such joy for me. Ah, she was one you loved, no doubt, through good and evil, through rain and drought. And when she passed, all your sun went out? Nay, she was the woman I did not love, whom all the others were ranked above, whom during her life I thought nothing of. End of section 40 this recording is in the public domain. Section 41 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Lyrics and Reveries, Continued. Self-Unconscious Along the way he walked that day, Watching shapes that reveries limb and seldom he had eyes to see the moment that encompassed him. Bright yellow hammers made mirthful clamors, and built long straws with a bustling air, and bearing their load, flew up the road that he followed, alone, without interest there. From bank to ground, and over and round, they sidled along the adjoining hedge. Sometimes to the gutter, their yellow flutter, would dip from the nearest slate-stone ledge, the smooth sea-line, with a metal shine, and flashes of white, and a sail thereon, he would also descry, with a half-wrapped eye, between the projects he mused upon. Yes, round him were these earth's artistries, but specious plans that came to his call did most engage his pilgrimage, while himself he did not see at all. Dead now as shirts are the yellow birds, and all that matter has passed away. Yet God, the elf, now shows him that self as he was and should have been shown that day. Oh, it would have been good, could he then have stood at a focused distance and conned the whole, but now such vision is mere derision, nor soothes his body, nor saves his soul. Not much, some may incline to say, to see therein had it all been seen. Nay, he is aware a thing was there that loomed with an immortal mien. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Discovery I wandered to a crude coast, like a ghost. Upon the hills I saw fires, funeral pyres, seemingly, and heard breaking waves like distant cannonades that set the land shaking. And so I never once guessed a love nest, bowered and candle-lit, lay in my way, till I found a hid hollow, where I burst on her my heart could not but follow. End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Tolerance. It is a foolish thing, said I, to bear with such and pass it by. Yet so I do, I know not why. And at each clash I would surmise that if I had acted otherwise, I might have saved me many sighs. But now the only happiness in looking back that I possess, whose lack would leave me comfortless, is to remember I refrained from masteries I might have gained, and for my tolerance was disdained. For see, a tomb, and if it were I had bent and broke, I should not dare to linger in the shadows there. End of section 43 This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Before and After Summer 1. Looking forward to the spring, one puts up with anything. On this February day, though the winds leap down the street, wintry scourgings seem but play and these later shafts of sleet, sharper pointed than the first, and these later snows, the worst, are as a half-transparent blind riddled by rays from sun behind. 2. Shadows of the October pine reach into this room of mine. On the pine there stands a bird. He is shadowed with a tree. Mutely perched, he bills no word, Blank as I am, even as he. For those happy suns are past, Four discerned in winter last. When went by their pleasure then? I, alas, perceived not when. End of section 44 This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. At day close in November. The ten hours light is abating, and the late bird flies across, where the pines, like waltzers waiting, give their black heads a toss. Beech leaves that yellow the noontime float past like specks in the eye. I set every tree in my June time, and now they obscure the sky. And the children who ramble through here conceive that there never has been a time when no tall trees grew here, a time when none will be seen. End of section 45. This recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. The Year's Awakening How do you know that the pilgrim track along the belting zodiac, swept by the sun in his seeming rounds, is traced by now to the fish's bounds, and into the ram, when weeks of cloud have wrapped the sky in a clammy shroud? and never as yet a tinct of spring has shown in the earth's apparelling. O oh, vespering bird, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know deep underground, hid in your bed from sight and sound, without a turn in temperature, with weather life can scarce endure, that light has won a fraction's strength, and they put on some moment's length, whereof in merest road will come, weeks hence mild airs that do not numb, O oh, crocus root, how do you know? How do you know? February 1910 End of section 46 This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter under the waterfall whenever i plunge my arm like this in a basin of water 
I never miss the sweet, sharp sense of a fugitive day fetched back from its thickening shroud of grey. Hence the only prime and real love rhyme that I know by heart, and that leaves no smart, is the pearl of a little valley fall, about three spans wide and two spans tall, over a table of solid rock, and into a scoop of the selfsame block, the pearl of a runlet that never ceases in stir of kingdoms in wars in pieces with a hollow boiling voice it speaks it has spoken since hills were turfless peaks and why gives this the only prime idea to you of a real love rhyme and why does plunging your arm in a bowl full of spring water bring throbs to your soul well under the fall, in a crease of the stone, though where precisely none ever has known, jammed darkly, nothing to show how prized, and by now with its smoothness opalized, is a drinking glass. For down that pass, my lover and I walked under a sky of blue with a leaf woven awning of green in the burn of August to paint the scene. And we placed our basket of fruit and wine By the runlet's rim where we sat to dine. And when we had drunk from the glass together, Arched by the oak copse from the weather, I held the vessel to rinse in the fall, Where it slipped and sank and was past recall, Though we stooped and plumbed the little abyss With long bared arms. There the glass still is, and... As said, if I thrust my arm below cold water in basin or bowl, a throw from the past awakens a sense of that time, and the glass both used, and the cascades rhyme. The basin seems the pool, and its edge the hard smooth face of the brookside ledge, and the leafy pattern of china ware, the hanging plants that were bathing there. By night, by day, when it shines or lowers, there lies intact that chalice of ours, and its presence adds to the rhyme of love persistently sung by the fall above. No lip has touched it since his and mine, and turns therefrom sipped lover's wine. End of section 47 This recording is in the public domain. Section 48 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Spell of the Rose I mean to build a hall anon, and shape two turrets there, and a broad newel stair, and a cool well for crystal water. Yes, I will build a hall anon, plant roses love shall feed upon, and apple trees and pear. He set to build the manor hall, and shaped the turrets there, and the broad newel stair, and the cool well for crystal water. He built for me that manor hall, and planted many trees withal, but no rose anywhere. And as he planted never a rose that bears the flower of love, though other flowers throve, a frost wind moved our souls to sever, since he had planted never a rose and misconceits raised horrid shows, and agonies came thereof. I'll mend these miseries, then said I, and so, at dead of night, I went, and screened from sight, that naught should keep our souls in severance, I set a rose-bush. This, said I, may end divisions dire and wry, and long-drawn days of blight. But I was called from earth, yea, called, before my rose-bush grew, and would that now I knew what fields he of the tree I planted, and whether, after I was called to be a ghost, he, as of old, gave me his heart anew. Perhaps now blooms that queen of trees I set but saw not grow, and he, beside its glow, eyes couched on the misvision that blurred me, I, there beside that queen of trees, he sees me as I was, though sees too late to tell me so. 
End of section 48. This recording is in the public domain. Section 49 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. St. Launces Revisited Slip back time, yet again I am nearing castle and keep, uprearing grey as in my prime. At the inn, smiling close, why is it not as on my visit, when hope and I were twin? Groom and jade, whom I found here, moulder, strange the tavern holder, strange the tap maid. Here I hired horse and man for bearing me on my wayfaring to the door desired. Evening gloomed as I journeyed forward to the faces shoreward till their dwelling loomed. If again towards the Atlantic sea there I should speed, they'd be there, surely now as then. Why waste thought when I know them vanished under earth, yea, banished ever into naught? End of section 49. This recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Poems of 1912 to 13. Veteris Vestigia Flamme. The Going. Why did you give no hint that night, that quickly after the morrow's dawn, and calmly, as if indifferent quite, you would close your term here, up and be gone, where I could not follow, with wing of swallow, to gain one glimpse of you ever anon? Never to bid good-bye, or give me the softest call, or utter a wish for a word, while I saw morning harden upon the wall, unmoved, unknowing, that your great going had placed that moment, and altered all. Why do you make me leave the house, and think for a breath it is you I see, at the end of the alley of bending boughs, where so often at dusk you used to be, till in darkening dankness the yawning blankness of the perspective sickens me? You were she who abode by those red-veined rocks far west. You were the swan-necked one who rode along the beetling beany crest, and reigning nigh me would muse and eye me while life unrolled us its very best. Why then latterly did we not speak, did we not think of those days long dead, and ere your vanishing strive to seek that time's renewal, we might have said, in this bright spring weather, we'll visit together those places that once we visited. Well, well, all's past amend, unchangeable, it must go. I seem but a dead man held on end to sink down soon. Oh, you could not know that such swift fleeing, no soul foreseeing, not even I, would undo me so. December 1912 End of section 50 this recording is in the public domain. Section 51 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Your Last Drive. Here by the moorway you returned and saw the burrow lights ahead that lit your face all undiscerned to be in a week the face of the dead. And you told of the charm of that haloed view that never again would beam on you. And on your left you passed the spot where eight days later you were to lie and be spoken of as one who was not, beholding it with a cursory eye as alien from you, though under its tree you soon would halt everlastingly. I drove not with you, yet had I sat at your side that eve, I should not have seen that the countenance I was glancing at had a last time look in the flickering sheen, nor have read the writing upon your face. I go hence soon to my resting place. You may miss me then, 
that I shall not know how many times you visit me there, or what your thoughts are, or if you go there never at all, and I shall not care. Should you censure me, I shall take no heed, and even your praises I shall not need. True, never you'll know, and you will not mind. But shall I then slight you because of such? Dear ghost, in the past did you ever find the thought, what profit, move me much, yet the fact indeed remains the same. You are past love, praise, indifference, blame. December 1912 End of section 51 This recording is in the public domain. Section 52 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Walk You did not walk with me, of late, to the hilltop tree, by the gated ways, as in earlier days. You were weak and lame, so you never came, and I went alone, and I did not mind, not thinking of you as left behind. I walked up there today, just in the former way, surveyed around the familiar ground by myself again. What difference then? Only that underlying sense of the look of a room on returning thence. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 53 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Rain on a Grave Clouds spout upon her, their waters amain in ruthless disdain. Her, who but lately had shivered with pain, as at touch of dishonor, if there had lit on her so coldly, so straightly such arrows of rain. She who to shelter her delicate head would quicken and quicken each tentative tread, if drops chanced to pelt her, that summertime spills in dust-paven rills, when thunderclouds thicken and birds close their bills. Would that I lay there, and she were housed here, or better, together were folded away there, exposed to one weather we both who would stray there when sunny the day there, or evening was clear at the prime of the year. Soon will be growing green blades from her mound, and daisies be showing like stars on the ground, till she form part of them, I, the sweet heart of them, loved beyond measure, with a child's pleasure all her life's round. January 31st, 1913 End of section 53 This recording is in the public domain. Section 54 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia I found her out there I found her out there on a slope few see that falls westwardly to the salt-edged air where the ocean breaks on the purple strand and a hurricane shakes the solid land. I brought her here and have laid her to rest in a noiseless nest no sea beats near. She will never be stirred in her loamy cell by the waves long heard and loved so well. So she does not sleep by those haunted heights the Atlantic smites and the blind gales sweep, whence she often would gaze at Dundagel's far head while the dipping blaze dyed her face fire red, and would sigh at the tale of sunk Lyonnais as a wind-tugged tress flapped her cheek like a flail, or listen at wilds with a thought-bound brow to the murmuring miles she is far from now. Yet her shade, maybe, will creep underground till it catch the sound of that western sea, 
as it swells and sobs where she once domiciled and joy in its throbs with the heart of a child end of section fifty four this recording is in the public domain section fifty five of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox .org by sonia without ceremony it was your way my dear to be gone without a word when callers friends or kin had left and i hastened in to rejoin you as i inferred and when you had a mind to career off anywhere say to town you were all on a sudden gone before i had thought thereon or noticed your trunks were down so now that you disappear for ever in that swift style your meaning seems to me just as it used to be goodbye is not worth while end of section 55 this recording is in the public domain section 56 of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for LibriVox.org by sonia lament how she would have loved a party to-day bright-hatted and gloved with table and tray and chairs on the lawn her smiles would have shone with welcomings but she is shut she is shut from friendship's spell in the jailing shell of her tiny cell or she would have reigned at a dinner to-night with ardours unfeigned and a generous delight all in her abode she'd have freely bestowed on her guests but alas she is shut under grass where no cups flow powerless to know that it might be so and she would have sought with a child's eager glance the shy snowdrops brought by the new year's advance and peered in the rhyme of candlemas time for crocuses chanced it that she were not tranced from sights she loved best wholly possessed by an infinite rest and we are here staying amid these stale things who care not for gaying and those junketings that used so to joy her and never to cloy her as us they cloy but she is shut she is shut from the cheer of them dead to all done and said in a yew arched bed end of section fifty six this recording is in the public domain section fifty seven of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox .org by sonia the haunter he does not think that i haunt here nightly how shall i let him know that whither his fancy sets him wandering i too alertly go hover and hover a few feet from him just as i used to do but cannot answer his words addressed me only listen thereto when i could answer he did not say them when i could let him know how i would like to join in his journeys seldom he wished to go now that he goes and wants me with him more than he used to do never he sees my faithful phantom though he speaks thereto yes i accompany him to places only dreamers know where the shy hares limp long paces where the night rooks go into old aisles where the past is all to him close as his shade can do always lacking the power to call to him near as i reach there too what a good haunter i am oh tell him quickly make him know if he but sigh since my loss befell him straight to his side i go tell him a faithful one is doing all that love can do still that his path may be worth pursuing and to bring peace thereto end of section fifty seven this recording is in the public domain Section 58 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. 
The Voice Woman much missed, how you call to me, call to me, saying that now you are not as you were, when you had changed from the one who was all to me, but as at first, when our day was fair. Can it be you that I hear? Let me view you then, standing as when I drew near to the town where you would wait for me. Yes, as I knew you then, even to the original air-blue gown. Or is it only the breeze, in its listlessness, traveling across the wet mead to me here, you being ever consigned to existlessness, heard no more again far or near? Thus I, faltering forward, leaves around me falling, wind oozing thin through the thorn from Norwood, and the woman calling. December, 1912 End of section 58 This recording is in the public domain. Section 59 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia His Visitor I come across from Melstock while the moon wastes weaker to behold where I lived with you for twenty years and more. I shall go in the grey at the passing of the mail train and need no setting open of the long familiar door as before. The change I notice in my one's own quarters, a brilliant budded border where the daisies used to be, the rooms new painted and the pictures altered, and other cups and saucers, and no cosy nook for tea, as with me. I discern the dim faces of the sleep-wrapped servants. They are not those who tended me through feeble hours and strong, but strangers quite, who never knew my rule here, who never saw me painting, never heard my softening song, flowed along. So I don't want to linger in this redecked dwelling. I feel too uneasy at the contrasts I behold and I make again for Melstock to return here never, and rejoin the roomy silence and the mute and manifold souls of old. 1913 End of section 59 This recording is in the public domain. Section 60 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with miscellaneous pieces by Thomas Hardy, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. A circular. As legal representative, I read a missive not my own on new designs the senders give for clothes in tints as shown. Here figure blouses, gowns for tea, and presentation trains of state, charming ball dresses, millinery warranted up to date. And this gay pictured springtime shout of fashion hails what lady proud, her who before last year was out was costumed in a shroud. End of section sixty. This recording is in the public domain. Section sixty one of Satires of Circumstance. Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter A Dream or No Why go to St. Juliet? What's Juliet to me? I was but made fancy by some necromancy That much of my life claims the spot as its key. Yes, I have had dreams of that place in the West, and a maiden abiding, thereat as in hiding, fair-eyed and white-shouldered, broad-browed and brown-tressed, and of how, coastward bound on a night long ago, there lonely I found her, the sea-birds around her, and other than nigh things uncaring to know. So sweet her life there, in my thought has it seemed, 
that quickly she drew me to take her unto me, and lodge her long years with me. Such have I dreamed. But not of that maid from St. Juliet I see. Can she ever have been here, and shed her life's sheen here, the woman I thought a long housemate with me? Does there even a place like St. Juliet exist, or a Valency Valley, with stream and leafed alley, or Beanie, or Bose, with its flounce flinging mist? February 1913 End of section 61 This recording is in the public domain. Section 62 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia After a Journey Here too I come to interview a ghost. Whither, oh, whither will its whim now draw me? Up the cliff, down, till I'm lonely, lost, and the unseen water's ejaculations awe me. Where you will next be there's no knowing, facing round about me everywhere, with your nut-coloured hair and grey eyes and rose-flush coming and going. Yes, I have re-entered your olden haunts at last, through the years, through the dead scenes I have tracked you. What have you now found to say of our past, viewed across the dark space wherein I have lacked you? Summer gave us sweets, but autumn wrought division? Things were not lastly as firstly well with us twain, you tell. But all's closed now, despite time's derision. I see what you are doing. You are leading me on, to the spots we knew when we haunted there together, the waterfall above which the mist bow shone, and the then fair hour in the then fair weather, and the cave just under, with a voice still so hollow, that it seemed to call out to me from forty years ago, when you were all aglow, and not the thin ghost that I now frailly follow. Ignorant of what there is flitting here to see, the waked birds preen and the seals flop lazily. Soon you will have, dear, to vanish from me, for the stars close their shutters and the dawn whitens hazily. Trust me, I mind not, though lie flowers, the bringing me here. Nay, bring me here again. I am just the same as when our days were joy and our path through flowers. Pentagon Bay End of section 62 this recording is in the public domain. Section 63 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. A Death Day Recalled Beanie did not quiver, Juliet grew not grey, Thin Valancy's river held its wonted way. Boss seemed not to utter dimmest note of dirge, Targan mouth a mutter to its creamy surge. Yet though these, unheeding, listless past the hour of her spirit's speeding, she had in her flower sought and loved the places, much and often pined for their lonely faces when in towns confined. Why did not Valancy, in his pearl deplore, one whose horns were whence he, drew his limpid store. Why did Boss not thunder, Targan apprehend, body and breath were sunder of their former friend? End of section 63. This recording is in the public domain. Section 64 of Satires of Circumstance. Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Beanie Cliff, March 1870 to March 1913. 1. O oh, the opal and the sapphire of that wandering western sea, and the woman riding high above with bright hair flapping free, the woman whom I loved so, and who loyally loved me. 2. The pale muse plained below us, and the waves seemed far away in another sky, engrossed in saying their ceaseless babbling say, 
as we laughed light-heartedly aloft on that clear sunned March day. Three. A little cloud then cloaked us, and there flew an irised rain, and the Atlantic dyed its levels with a dull, misfeatured stain, and then the sun burst out again, and purples prinked the main. Four. Still in all its chasmal beauty bulks old Beanie to the sky, and shall she and I not go there once again now March is nigh, and the sweet things said in that March, saying you there by and by? Five. What if still in chasmal beauty looms that wild, weird western shore? The woman now is, elsewhere, whom the ambling pony bore and nor knows nor cares for beanie and will see it never more end of section 64 this recording is in the public domain section 65 of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox.org by thomas peter at Castle Botterell. As I drive to the junction of lane and highway, and the drizzle bedrenches the wagonette, I look behind at the fading byway, and see on its slope, now glistening wet, distinctly yet, myself and a girlish form benighted in dry March weather. We climb the road beside a chaise, we had just alighted to ease the sturdy pony's load, when he sighed and slowed. What we did as we climbed, and what we talked of, matters not much, nor to what it led. Something that life will not be balked of without rude reason, till hope is dead, and feeling fled. It filled but a minute, but was there ever a time of such quality? since or before in that hill's story to one mind never though it has been climbed foot swift foot sore by thousands more primeval rocks form the road's steep border and much have they faced there first and last of the transitory and earth's long order but what they record in color and cast is that we too passed. And to me, though time's unflinching rigor, in mindless rote, has ruled from sight the substance now, one phantom figure remains on the slope, as when that night saw us alight. I look and see it there, shrinking, shrinking. I look back at it amid the rain for the very last time, for my sand is sinking, and I shall traverse old love's domain never again. March 1913 End of section 65 This recording is in the public domain. Section 66 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Places Nobody says, ah, that is the place where chanced in the hollow of years ago what none of the three towns cared to know, the birth of a little girl of grace, the sweetest the house saw, first or last. Yet it was so, on that day long past. Nobody thinks, there, there she lay in a room by the hoe, like the bud of a flower, and listened just after the bedtime hour to the stammering chimes that used to play the quaint old hundred and thirteenth tune in St. Andrew's Tower, night, morn, and noon. Nobody calls to mind that here, upon Botterell Hill, where the carters skid, with cheeks whose airy flush outbid, fresh fruit in bloom, and free of fear, she cantered down as if she must fall, though she never did, to the charm of all. Nay, one there is to whom these things that nobody else's mind calls back 
have a savour that seems in being lack and a presence more than the actual brings to whom to-day is beneaped and stale and its urgent clack but a vapid tale plymouth march nineteen thirteen end of section sixty six this recording is in the public domain Section 67 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Traveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Phantom Horsewoman 1. Queer are the ways of a man I know. He comes and stands in a careworn craze, and looks at the sands and the seaward haze, with moveless hands and face and gaze, then turns to go. And what does he see when he gazes so? 2. They say he sees as an instant thing, more clear than today, a sweet soft scene that once was in play by that briny green. Yes, notes alway, warm, real, and keen, what his back years bring, a phantom of his own figuring. 3. Of this vision of his they might say more, not only there does he see this sight, but everywhere, in his brain, day, night, as if on the air it were drawn rose bright. Yea, far from that shore does he carry this vision of heretofore. 4. A ghost girl rider, and though toil tried, he withers daily, time touches her not, but she still rides gaily in his rapt thought on that shagged and shaly atlantic spot and as when first eyed draws rain and sings to the swing of the tide end of section sixty seven this recording is in the public domain section sixty eight of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for LibriVox .org. By Sonia and Thomas Peter. Miscellaneous Pieces The Wistful Lady Love, while you were away, there came to me, from whence I cannot tell, a plaintive lady, pale and passionless, who bent her eyes upon me critically, and weighed me with a wearing wistfulness, as if she knew me well. I saw no lady of that wistful sort as I came riding home. Perhaps she was some dame the fates constrain by memory sadder than she can support, or by unhappy vacancy of brain, to leave her roof and roam. Ah, but she knew me, and before this time I have seen her, lending ear to my light outdoor words, and pondering each, her frail white finger swayed in pantomime, as if she fain would close with me in speech, and yet would not come near. And once I saw her beckoning with her hand, as I came into sight at an upper window. And I at last went out, but when I reached where she had seemed to stand, and wandered up and down and searched about, I found she had vanished quite. Then thought I how my dead love used to say, with a small smile, when she was waning wan, that she would hover round and show herself after her passing day, to any newer love I might have found, but show her not to me. End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Woman in the Rye why do you stand in the dripping rye, cold-lipped, unconscious, wet to the knee, when there are firesides near? said I. I told him I wished him dead, said she. Yea, cried it in my haste to one whom I had loved, whom I well loved still, and die he did, and I hate the sun, and stand here lonely, aching, chill. Stand waiting, waiting under skies that blow reproach, the while I see the rooks sheer off to where he lies, wrapped in a peace withheld from me. End of section 69. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 70 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Cheval Glass Why do you harbor that great cheval glass Filling up your narrow room? You never preen or plume Or look in a week at your full-length figure Picture of bachelor gloom well, when I dwelt in ancient England, renting the valley farm, thoughtless of all heart harm, I used to gaze at the parson's daughter, a creature of nameless charm. Thither there came a lover and won her, carried her off from my view. Oh, it was then I knew misery of a cast and dreamt of, more than indeed my due. Then far rumours of her ill usage came, like a chilling breath when a man languisheth, followed by news that her mind lost balance, and in a space of her death. Soon sank her father, and next was the auction, everything to be sold. Mid things new and old stood this glass in her former chamber, long in her use, I was told. Well, I awaited the sale and bought it. There by my bed it stands, and as the dawn expands, often I see her pale-faced form there, brushing her hair's bright bands. There, too, at pallid midnight moments, quick she will come to my call, smile from the frame withal, ponderingly, as she used to regard me, passing her father's wall. So that it was for its revelations, I brought it over sea, and drag it about with me. And on I shall break it and bury its fragments, where my grave is to be. End of section seventy. This recording is in the public domain. Section seventy one of Satires of Circumstance. Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Reenactment Between the folding sea-downs, in the gloom of a wailful wintry nightfall, when the boom of the ocean, like a hammering in a hollow tomb, throbbed up the copse-clothed valley from the shore to the chamber where I darkled, Sunk and sore with grey ponderings Why my loved one had not come before To salute me in the dwelling That of late I had hired to waste a while in Vague of date, quaint and remote Wherein I now expectant sate On the solitude, unsignalled Broke a man who, in air as if at home there seemed to scan every fire-flecked nook of the apartment span by span a stranger's and no lover's eyes were these eyes of a man who measures what he sees but vaguely as if wrapped in filmy fantasies yea his bearing was so absent as he stood it bespoke a chord so plaintive in his mood that soon i judged he would not wrong my quietude Ah, the supper is just ready, then he said, and the year's long binned Madeira flashes red. There was no wine, no food, no supper table spread. You will forgive my coming, Lady Fair. I see you as at that time rising there, the selfsame curious querying in your eyes and air. Yet no, how so? You wear not the same gown. Your locks show woeful difference, are not brown. What, is it not as when I hither came from town? And the place, but you seem other. Can it be? What's this that time is doing unto me? You dwell here, unknown woman. Whereabouts, then, is she? And the house, things are much shifted. Put them where they stood on this night's fellow. Shift her chair. Here was the couch. 
and the piano should be there. I indulged him, verily nerve-strained being alone, and I moved the things as bidden, one by one, and feigned to push the old piano where he had shown. Aha! Now I can see her. Stand aside. Don't thrust her from the table where, meek-eyed, she makes attempt with matron manners to preside. She serves me. Now she rises, goes to play. But you obstruct her, fill her with dismay, and embarrassed, scared, she vanishes away. And, as to her useless longer to persist, he sighed, and sought the entry ere I wist, and retreated, disappearing soundless in the mist. That here some mighty passion once had burned, which still the walls engosted, I discerned, and that by its strong spell mine might be overturned. I sat depressed, till later my love came, but something in the chamber dimmed our flame, an emanation making our due words fall tame, as if the intenser drama shown me there of what the walls had witnessed filled the air, and left no room for later passion anywhere. So came it that our fervours did quite fail of future consummation, being made quail by the weird witchery of the parlour's hidden tale, which I, as years passed, faintly learnt to trace. One of sad love, born full-winged in that place where the predestined sorrowers first stood face to face. And as that month of winter circles round, and the evening of the date-day grows embrowned, I am conscious of those presences, and sit spellbound. There often, lone, forsaken, queries breed within me, whether a phantom had my heed on that strange night, or was it some wrecked heart indeed? End of section 71 this recording is in the public domain. Section 72 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Her Secret That love's dull smart distressed my heart, he shrewdly learned to see. But that I was in love with a dead man, never suspected he. He searched for the trace of a pictured face. He watched each missive come, and a note that seemed like a love line made him look frozen and glum. He dogged my feet to the city street. He followed me to the sea, but not to the neighboring churchyard did he dream of following me. End of section 72. This recording is in the public domain. Section 73 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter She charged me She charged me with having said this and that to another woman long years before, in the very parlour where we sat, sat on a night when the endless pour of rain on the roof and the road below bent the spring of the spirit more and more. So charged she me, and the cupid's bow of her mouth was hard, and her eyes and her face and her white forefinger lifted slow. Had she done it gently, or shown a trace that not too curiously would she view a folly past ere her reign had place, a kiss might have ended it. But I knew from the fall of each word, and the pause between, that the curtain would drop upon us too ere long, in our play of slave and queen. End of section 73. This recording is in the public domain. Section 74 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. 
the newcomer's wife he paused on the sill of a door ajar that screened a lively liquor bar for the name had reached him through the door of her he had married the week before we called her the hack of the parade but she was discreet in the games she played if slightly worn she's pretty yet and gossips after all forget and he knows nothing of her past i'm glad the girl's in luck at last such ones though stale to native eyes newcomers snatch at as a prize yes being a stranger he sees her blend of all that's fresh and innocent nor dreams how many a love campaign she had enjoyed before his reign that night there was the splash of a fall over the slimy harbour wall they searched and at the deepest place found him with crabs upon his face end of section seventy four this recording is in the public domain section seventy five of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by thomas peter and by sonia a conversation at dawn he lay awake with a harassed air and she in her cloud of loose lank hair seemed trouble tried as the dawn drew in on their faces there the chamber looked far over the sea from a white hotel on a white stoned quay and stepping astride he parted the window drapery above the level horizon spread the sunrise firing them foot to head from its smouldering lair and painting their pillows with dyes of red what strange disquiets have stirred you dear this dragging night with starts and fear of me as it were or of something evil hovering near my husband can i have fear of you what should one fear from a man whom few or none had matched in that late long spell of delays undue he watched her eyes in the heaving sun then what has kept o oh, reticent one those lids unlatched anything promised i've not yet done oh it's not a broken promise of yours for what quite lightly your lip assures the due time brings that has troubled my sleep and no waking cures i have shaped my will tis at hand said he i subscribe it to-day that no risk there be in the hap of things of my leaving you menaced by poverty that the boon provision i'm safe to get signed sealed by my lord as it were debt i cannot doubt or ever this peering sun be set but you flung my arms away from your side and faced the wall no month old bride ere the tour be out in an air so loth can be justified ah had you a male friend once loved well upon whose suit disaster fell and frost turned swift honest you are and may care to tell she lay impassive and nothing broke the stillness other than stroke by stroke the lazy lift of the tide below them till she spoke i once had a friend a love if you will whose wife forsook him and sank until she was made a thrall in a prison cell for a deed of ill he remained alone and we met to love but barring legitimate joy thereof stood the doorless wall though we prized each other all else above and this is why though i touched my prime i put off suitors from time to time yourself with the rest till friends who approved you called it crime and when misgivings weighed on me in my lover's absence hurriedly and much distressed i took you ah that such could be now saw you when crossing from yonder shore at yesternoon that the packet bore on a white wreathed bier a coffined body towards the fore well while you stood at the other end the loungers talked and i could but lend a listening ear for they named the dead twas the wife of my friend he was there but did not note me veiled yet i saw that a joy as of one unjailed now shone in his gaze he knew not his hope of me just had failed they had brought her home she was born in this isle and he will return to his domicile and pass his days alone and not as he dreamt erstwhile 
So you've lost a sprucer spouse than I. She held her peace, as if fain denied she would indeed for his pleasure's sake, but could lip no lie. One far less formal and plain and slow. She let the laconic assertion go, as if of need she held the conviction that it was so. Regard me as his he always should, he had said, and wed me he vowed he would in his prime or seer most verily do, if ever he could. And this fulfilment is now his aim, for a letter, addressed in my maiden name, has dogged me here, reminding me faithfully of his claim. And it started a hope like a lightning streak that I might go to him, say, for a week, and afford you right to put me away and your vows unspeak. To be sure you have said, as of dim intent, that marriage is a plain event of black and white, without any ghost of sentiment. And my heart has quailed, but deny it true that you will never this lock undo. No god intends to thwart the yearning he's father to. The husband hemmed, then blandly bowed in the light of the angry morning cloud. So my idol ends, and a drama opens, he mused aloud. His features froze. You may take it as true that I will never this lock undo, for so depraved a passion as that which kindles you. Said she, I am sorry you see it so. I had hoped you might have let me go, and thus be saved the pain of learning there's more to know. More? What may that be? God, I think you have told me enough to make me blink. But if more remain, then own it to me. I will not shrink. Well, it is this. As we could not see that a legal marriage could ever be, to end our pain we united ourselves informally, and vowed at a chancel altar nigh, with book and ring, a lifelong tie, a contract vain to the world, but real to him on high. And you became as his wife? I did. He stood as stiff as a caryatid, and said, Indeed, no matter, you're mine, whatever you ye hid. But is it right, when I only gave my hand to you in a sweat to save, through desperate need, as I thought, my fame, for I was not brave? To save your fame? Your meaning is dim, for nobody knew of your altar whim. I mean, I feared, there might be fruit of my tie with him. And to cloak it by marriage, I'm not the first, though maybe morally most accursed, through your unpeered and strict uprightness. That's the worst. While yesterday his worn contours convinced me that love like his endures, and that my troth plight had been his, in fact, and not truly yours. So, my lady, you raise the veil by degrees. I own this last is enough to freeze the warmest white. Now hear the other side, if you please. I did say once, though without intent, that marriage is a plain event of black and white, whatever may be its sentiment. I'll act accordingly, none the less that you soiled the contract in time of stress, thereto induced by the feared results of your wantonness. And the thing is over, and no one knows it's not to the future what you disclose that you'll be loosed for such an episode don't suppose no i'll not free you and if it appear there was too good ground for your first fear from your amorous tricks i'll father the child yes by god my dear even should you fly to his arms i'll damn opinion and fetch you treat a sham your mutinous kicks to whip you home that's the sort i am she whitened enough since you disapprove i'll yield in silence and never move till my last pulse ticks a footstep from the domestic groove then swear it he said and your king on crown he drew her forth in her long white gown and she knelt and swore good now you may go and again lie down since you've played these pranks and given no sign, 
you shall crave this man of yours pine and pine with sighing sore till i've starved your love for him nailed you mine i'm a practical man and want no tears you've made a fool of me it appears that you don't again is the lesson i'll teach you in future years she answered not but lay listlessly with her dark dry eyes on the coppery sea that now and then flung its lazy flounce at the neighboring quay 1910 end of section 75 this recording is in the public domain Section 76 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter A King's Soliloquy on the Night of His Funeral From the slow march and muffled drum and crowds distressed and book and bell at length I have come to my full rest a ten years rule beneath the sun is wound up here and what i have done what left undone figures out clear yet in the estimate of such it grieves me more that i by some was loved so much than that i bore from others judgment of that hue which over hope breeds from a theoretic view of regal scope for kingly opportunities right many have sighed how best to bear its devilries those learn who have tried i have eaten the fat and drunk the sweet lived the life out from the first greeting glad drum beat to the last shout what pleasure earth affords to kings i have enjoyed through its long vivid pulse stirring even till it cloyed what days of drudgery nights of stress can cark a throne even one maintained in peacefulness i too have known and so i think could i step back to life again i should prefer the average track of average men since as with them what kingship would it cannot do nor to first thoughts however good hold itself true something binds hard the royal hand is all that be and it is that has shaped has planned my acts and me may nineteen ten end of section seventy six this recording is in the public domain. Section 77 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Coronation At Westminster, hid from the light of day, many who once had shone as monarchs lay edward the pious and two edwards more the second richard henry's three or four that is to say those who were called the third fifth seventh and eighth the much self-widowered and james the scot and near him charles the second and too the second george could there be reckoned of women mary and queen elizabeth and anne all silent in amusing death and william's mary and mary queen of scots and consort queens whose names oblivion blots and several more whose chronicle one sees adorning ancient royal pedigrees now as they drowsed on freed from life's old thrall and heedless save of things exceptional said one what means this throbbing thudding sound that reaches to us here from over ground a sound of chisels augers planes and saws infringing all ecclesiastic laws and these tons weight of timber on us pressed unfelt here since we entered into rest surely at least to us being corpses royal a meet repose is owing by the loyal perhaps a scaffold 
Mary Stuart sighed. If such still be, it was that way I died. Odds, far more like, said he the many-wived, that for a wedding this this work's contrived. Ha ha, I never would bow down to women, but I had a rare time with those six women. Not all at once, gasped he who loved confession. Nay, nay, said Hell, that would have been transgression. They build a catafalque here, black and tall. Perhaps, mused Richard, for some funeral. And Anne chimed in, Ah, yes, it may be so. Nay, squeaked Eliza, little you seem to know. Clearly it is for some crowning here in state, as they crowned us at our long bygone date. Though we'd no such power of carpentry, but let the ancient architecture be. If I were up there where the parsons sit, in one of my gold robes, I'd see to it. <laughs> but you are not, Charles chuckled. You are here, and never will know the sun again, my dear. Yeah, whispered those whom no one had addressed. With slow sad march amid a folk distressed, we were brought here to take our dusty rest. And here, alas, in darkness laid below, we'll wait and listen and endure the show clamour dogs kingship afterwards not so nineteen eleven end of section seventy seven this recording is in the public domain section seventy eight of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by sonia aquae sulis the chimes called midnight just at interloon and the daytime talk of the roman investigations was checked by silence save for the husky tune the bubbling waters played near the excavations and the warm air came up from underground and a flutter as of a filmy shape unsepulchred that collected itself and waited and looked around nothing was seen but utterances could be heard those of the goddess whose shrine was beneath the pile of the god with the baldachined altar overhead and what did you get by raising this nave and aisle close on the site of the temple i tenanted the notes of your organ have thrilled down out of you to the earth-clogged wrecks of my edifice many a year though stately and shining once i long ere you had set up crucifix and candle here your priests have trampled the dust of mine without ruing, despising the joys of men whom I so much loved, though my springs boil on by your Gothic arcades and pewing, and sculptures crude, would Jove they could be removed. Repress, O oh lady proud, your traditional ires. You know not by what a frail thread we equally hang. It is said we are images both, twitched by people's desires, and that I, like you, fail as a song man yesterday sang. And the old dark hid the cavities laid laid bare, and all was suspended and soundless as before, except for a gossamery noise fading off in the air, and the boiling voice of the water's medicinal pour. Bath End of section 78 This recording is in the public domain. Section 79 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. 74 and 20 Here goes a man of 74, who sees not what life means for him, and here another, in years a score, who reads its very figure and trim. The one who shall walk today with me is not the youth who gazes far, but the breezy white who cannot see what earth ingrained conditions are. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 80 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. 
the elopement. A woman never agreed to it, said my knowing friend to me. That one thing she refused to do for Solomon's mines and fee. No woman ever will make herself look older than she is. I did not answer, but I thought, you err there, ancient quiz. It took a rare one true to do it, for she was surely rare, as rare a soul at that sweet time of her life as she was fair. And urging motives, too, were strong, for ours was a passionate case, yea, passionate enough to lead to freaking with that young face. I have told no one about it, should perhaps make few believe, but I think it over now that life looms dull and years bereave. How blank we stood at our bright wit's end, two frail barks in distress, how self-regard in her was slain by her large tenderness. I said, the only chance for us in a crisis of this kind is going it thorough. Yes, she calmly breathed. Well, I don't mind. And we blanched her dark locks ruthlessly, set wrinkles on her brow. Aye, she was a right rare woman then, whatever she may be now. That night we heard a coach drive up, and questions asked below. A gent with an elderly wife, sir, was returned from the bureau, and the wheels went rattling on, and free at last from public ken, we washed all off in her chamber, and restored her youth again. How many years ago it was, some fifty can it be, since that adventure held us, and she played old wife to me. But in time, convention won her, as it wins all women at last. And now she is rich and respectable, and time has buried the past. End of section 80. This recording is in the public domain. Section 81 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces. By Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. I rose up as my custom is. I rose up as my custom is on the eve of All Souls' Day, and left my grave for an hour or so to call on those I used to know before I passed away. I visited my former love as she lay by her husband's side. I asked her if life pleased her. Now she was rid of a poet wrung in brow, and crazed with the ills he eyed, who used to drag her here and there wherever his fancies led, and point out pale phantasmal things, and talk of vain, vague purposings that she discredited. She was quite civil, and replied, Old comrade, is that you? Well, on the whole, I like my life. I know I swore I'd be no wife, but what was I to do? You see, of all men for my sex, a poet is the worst. Women are practical, and they crave the wherewith to pay their way, and slake their social thirst. You were a poet, quite the ideal that we all love a while. But look at this man snoring here. He's no romantic chanticleer, yet keeps me in good style. He makes no quest into my thoughts, but a poet wants to know what one has felt from earliest days, why one thought not in other ways than one's loves of long ago. Her words benumbed my fond, frail ghost, the nightmares neighed from their stalls, the vampires screeched, the harpies flew, and under the dim dawn I withdrew to death's and violet halls. End of section 81. This recording is in the public domain. Section 82 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. A Week On Monday night I closed my door, and thought you were not as heretofore, and little cared if we met no more. 
i seemed on tuesday night to trace something beyond mere commonplace in your ideas and heart and face on wednesday i did not opine your life would ever be one with mine though if it were we should well combine on thursday noon i liked you well and fondly felt that we must dwell not far apart whatever befell on friday it was with a thrill in gazing towards your distant vill i owned you were my dear one still i saw you wholly to my mind on saturday even one who shrined all that was best of womankind as wing clipped seagull for the sea on sunday night i longed for thee without whom life were waste to me End of section 82. This recording is in the public domain. Section 83 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Had you wept? Had you wept? Had you but neared me with a frail, uncertain ray, Dewy as the face of the dawn, In your large and luminous eye, Then would have come back all the joys The tidings had slain that day, And a new beginning, A fresh, fair heaven, Have smoothed the things awry. But you were less feebly human, And no passionate need for clinging Possessed your soul, to overthrow reserve when I came near. I, though you suffer as much as I from storms the hours are bringing upon your heart and mine, I never see you shed a tear. The deep strong woman is weakest, the weak one is the strong. The weapon of all weapons best for winning you have not used. Have you never been able, or would you not, through the evil times and long? Has not the gift been given you, or such gift have you refused? When I bade me not absolve you on that evening or the morrow, why did you not make war on me with those who weep like rain? You felt too much, so gained no balm for all your torrid sorrow. And hence our deep division, and our dark undying pain. End of section 83. This recording is in the public domain. Section 84 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Bereft, she thinks she dreams. I dream that the dearest I ever knew has died and been entombed. I am sure it's a dream that cannot be true, but I am so overgloomed by its persistence that I would gladly have quick death take me, rather than longer think thus sadly. So wake me, wake me. It has lasted days, but minute and hour I expect to get aroused and find him as usual in the bower where we so happily housed. Yet stays this nightmare too appalling, and like a web shakes me, and piteously I keep on calling, and no one wakes me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 85 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. In the British Museum what do you see in that time-touched stone when nothing is there but ashen blankness although you give it a rigid stare you look not quite as if you saw but as if you heard parting your lips and treading softly as mouse or bird it is only the base of a pillar they'll tell you that came to us from a far old hill man used to name areopagus i know no art and I only view a stone from a wall, but I am thinking that stone has echoed the voice of Paul. Paul, as he stood and preached beside it, facing the crowd, a small gaunt figure 
with wasted features calling out loud words that in all their intimate accents pattered upon that marble front and were far reflected and then were gone i'm a laboring man and know but little or nothing at all but i can't help thinking that stone once echoed the voice of paul end of section 85 this recording is in the public domain Section 86 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. In the Servants' Quarters Man, you too, aren't you, one of these rough followers of the criminal, all hanging here about to gather how he's going to bear examination in the hall? She flung disdainful glances on the shabby figure standing at the fire with others there, who warmed them by its flare no indeed my skipping maiden i know nothing of the trial here or criminal if so he be i chance to come this way and the fire shone out into the dawn and morning airs are cold now i too was drawn in part by charms i see before me play that i see not every day ha <laughs> ha then laughed the constables who also stood to warm themselves the while another maiden scrutinized his features hard as the blaze threw into contrast every line and knot that wrinkled them, exclaiming, Why, last night when he was brought in by the guard, you were with him in the yard. Nay, nay, you teasing wench, I say, you know you speak mistakenly. Cannot a tired pedestrian who has footed it afar, here on his way from northern parts, engrossed in humble marketings, come in and rest awhile, although judicial doings are afoot by morning star? oh come come laughed the constables why man you speak the dialect he uses in his answers you can hear him up the stairs so own it we shan't hurt you there he is speaking now his syllables are those you sound yourself when you are talking unawares as this pretty girl declares and you shudder when his chain clings she rejoined oh yes i noticed it and you wince too when those cuffs they gave him echo to us here they'll soon be coming down and you may then have to defend yourself unless you hold your tongue or go away and keep you clear when he's led to judgment near no i'll be damned in hell if i know anything about the man no single thing about him more than everybody knows must not i even warm my hands but i am charged with blasphemies his face convulses as the morning cock that moment crows, and he stops and turns and goes. End of section 86. This recording is in the public domain. Section 87 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org. By Thomas Peter. The Obliterate Tomb. More than half my life long did they weigh me falsely to my bitter wrong, but they all have shrunk away into the silence like a lost song. And the day has dawned and come for forgiveness when the past may hold it dumb on the once reverberate words of hatred uttered half in delirium. With folded lips and hands they lie and wait what next the will commands, And doubtless think, if think they can, Let discord sink with life's sands. By these late years their names, their virtues, their hereditary claims, May be as near defacement at their grave-place as are their fames. Such thoughts perchance to seize a traveller's mind, a man of memories, as he set foot within the western city, where had died these, who in their lifetime deemed him their chief enemy, one whose brain had schemed to get their dingy greatness deeplier dingied and disesteemed. So, sojourning in their town, he mused on them and on their once renown, and said, I'll seek their resting place tomorrow, ere I lie down. And end, lest I forget, those hours of many years that I regret. Renew their names, 
that men may see some liegeness is left them yet. Duly next day he went, and sought the church he had known them to frequent, and wandered in the precincts, set on eyeing where they lay pent, till by remembrance led he stood at length beside their slighted bed, above which, truly, scarce a line or letter could now be read. Thus years obliterate their graven worth, their chronicle, their date, at once I'll garnish and revive the record of their past state. That still the sage may say, in pensive progress here where they decay, This stone records a luminous line whose talents told in their day. Or speaking thus he turned, for a form shadowed where they lay in earned, and he beheld a stranger in foreign vesture, and tropic burned. Sir, I am right pleased to view that ancestors of mine should interest you, for I have come of purpose here to trace them. They are time-worn, true, but that's a fault that most sculptors can cure. On the Pacific coast I avowed for long that relics of my forebears I trace here lost, and hear the word I come, before this same old time shall strike me numb to carry it out. Strange this is, said the other. What mind shall plumb coincident design? Though these my father's enemies were, and mine, I nourished a like purpose, to restore them each letter and line. Such magnanimity is now not needed, sir, for you will see that since I am here, a thing like this is plainly best done by me. The other bowed and left, crestfallen in sentiment, as one bereft of some fair object he had been moved to cherish by hands more deft. And as he slept that night, the phantoms of the insepulchred stood upright before him, trembling that he had set him seeking their charnel sight, and, as unknowing his ruth, asked as with terrors founded not on truth, why he should want them. Ah, they hollowly hackered, you come, forsooth, by stealth to obliterate our graven worth, our chronicle, our date, that our descendants may not gild the record of our past state, and that no sage may say, in pensive progress near where we decay, this stone records a luminous line whose talents told in their day. Upon the morrow he went, and to that town and churchyard never bent his aging footsteps till, some twelve months onward, an accident once more detained him there. And stirred by hauntings, he must needs repair to where the tomb was. Lo, it stood still, wasting in no man's care. The troubled man who met the last time, said the sexton, has not yet appeared again. The wealth he had in plenty. Can he forget? The architect was hired, and came here on smart summons as desired, but never the descendant came to tell him what he required. And so the tomb remained untouched, untended, crumbling, weather-stained. Though the one-time foe was fain to write it, he still refrained. I'll set about it when I am sure he'll come no more. Best wait till then. But so it was that never the stranger entered that city again. And the well-meaner died while waiting tremulously and satisfied that no return of the family's foreign scion would still betide. And many years slid by, and active church restorers cast their eye upon the ancient goth and hoary building the tomb stood nigh. And when they had scraped each wall, pulled out the stately pews, and smartened all, it will be well, declared the spruce churchwarden, to overhaul and broaden this path where shown. Nothing prevents it but an old tombstone pertaining to a family forgotten, of deeds unknown. Their names can scarce be read. Depend on't, all who care for them are dead. So went the tomb, whose shards were as path-paving distributed. Over it and about men's footsteps beat, and wind and water spout, 
until the names, aforetime gnawed by weathers, were quite worn out. So that no stage can say, in pensive progress near where they decay, this stone records a luminous line whose talons told in the day. End of section 87. This recording is in the public domain. Section 88 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Regret not me. Regret not me. Beneath the sunny tree I lie uncaring, slumbering peacefully. Swift as the light I flew my fairy flight, ecstatically I moved and feared no night. I did not know that heydays fade and go, but deemed that what was would be always so. I skipped that morn between the yellowing corn, thinking it good and glorious to be born. I ran at eaves among the piled-up sheaves, Dreaming, I grieve not, therefore nothing grieves. Now soon will come the apple, pear and plum, And hinds will sing, and autumn insects hum. Again you will fare to cider makings rare, And junketings, but I shall not be there. Yet gaily sing until the pewter ring, Those songs we sang when we went gypsying. And lightly dance some triple-timed romance, In coupled figures, and forget mischance and mourn not me beneath the yellowing tree for i shall mind not slumbering peacefully end of section 88 this recording is in the public domain section 89 of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Recalcitrance. Let us often search and find a place where yours and mine can be natural lives, where no one comes who dissects and dives and proclaims that ours is a curious case, that its touch of romance can scarcely grace. You would think it strange at first, but then everything has been strange in its time. When someone said on a day of the prime he would bow to no brazen god again, he doubtless dazed the mass of men. None will recognize us as a pair whose claims to righteous judgment we care not making, who have doubted if breath be worth the taking, and have no respect for the current fames whence the savour has flown while abide the names. We have found us already shunned, disdained, and for reacceptance have not once striven. Whatever offence our course has given, the brunt thereof we have long sustained. Well, let us away, scorned unexplained. End of section 89. This recording is in the public domain. Section 90 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Starlings on the Roof No smoke spreads out of this chimney pot. The people who lived here have left the spot, and others are coming who knew them not. If you listen anon with an ear intent, the voices you'll find will be different from the well-known ones of those who went. Why did they go? Their tones so bland were quite familiar to our band. The comers we shall not understand. They look for a new life, rich and strange. They do not know that, let them range wherever they may, they will get no change. They will drag their house gear ever so far. In their search for a home no miseries mar. They will find that, as they were, they are. That every hearth has a ghost, alack, and can be but the scene of a bivouac, till they move perforce, no time to pack. End of section 90. This recording is in the public domain. Section 91 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Moon Looks In 
one i have risen again and a while survey by my chilly ray through your window-pane your upturned face as you think ah she now dreams of me in her distant place two i pierce her blind in her far-off home she fixes a comb and says in her mind i start in an hour whom shall i meet won't the man be sweet and the women sour end of section 91 this recording is in the public domain section ninety two of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by sonia the sweet hussy in his early days he was quite surprised when she told him she was compromised by meetings and lingerings at his whim and thinking not of herself but him while she lifted orbs aggrieved and round that scandal should so soon abound as she had raised them to nine or ten of antecedent nice young men and in remorse he thought with a sigh how good she is and how bad am i it was years before he understood that she was the wicked one he the good end of section ninety two this recording is in the public domain Section 93 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries, with Miscellaneous Pieces, by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. And Thomas Peter. The Telegram. Oh, he's suffering, maybe dying, and I not there to aid, and smooth his bed and whisper to him. Can I know how go? Only the nurse's brief twelve words thus hurriedly conveyed, as by stealth, to let me know. He was the best and brightest. Candor shone upon his brow, and I shall never meet again a soldier such as he. And I loved him ere I knew it, and perhaps he is sinking now, far, far removed from me. The arts ride mute at anchor, and the fulling moon is fair, and the giddy folk are strutting up and down the smooth parade, and in her wild distraction she seems not to be aware that she lives no more a maid, but has vowed and wived herself to one who blessed the ground she trod, to and from this scene of ministry, and thought her history known in its last particular to him, I, almost as to God, and believed her quite his own. So great her absent-mindedness, she droops as in a swoon, and a movement of aversion mars her recent spousal grace. And in silence we too sit here in our waning honeymoon, at this idle watering place. What now I see before me is a long lane overhung with lovelessness, and stretching from the present to the grave. And I would I were away from this, with friends I knew when young, ere a woman held me slave. End of section 93. This recording is in the public domain. Section 94 of Satires of Circumstance. Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. And by Sonia. The Moth Signal on Egdon Heath. What are you still, still thinking? He asked, in vague surmise. That stare at the wick unblinking, With those great, lost, luminous eyes. Oh, I see a poor moth burning in the candle flame, said she. Its wings and legs are turning to a cinder rapidly. Moths fly in from the heather, he said. Now the days decline. I know, said she. The weather, I hope, will at last be fine. I think, she added lightly, I'll look out at the door. The ring the moon wears nightly may be visible now no more. She rose, and, little heeding, her husband then went on, with his attentive reading, in the annals of ages gone. 
outside the house a figure came from the tumulus near and speedily waxed bigger and clasped and called her dear i saw the pale winged token you sent through the crack sighed she that moth is burned and broken with which you lured out me and were i as the moth is it might be better far for one whose marriage troth is shattered as potsherds are then grinned the ancient Briton from the tumulus treed with pine so hearts are thwartly smitten in these days as in mine end of section ninety four this recording is in the public domain section ninety five of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by sonia seen by the waits through snowy woods and shady we went to play a tune to the lonely manor lady by the light of the christmas moon we viled till upward glancing to where a mirror leaned we saw her airily dancing deeming her movements screened dancing alone in the room there thin draped in her robe of night her postures glassed in the gloom there were a strange phantasmal sight she had learned we heard when homing that her roving spouse was dead why she had danced in the gloaming we thought but never said end of section ninety five this recording is in the public domain section ninety six of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by thomas peter the two soldiers just at the corner of the wall we met yes he and i who had not faced in camp or hall since we bade home good-bye and what once happened came back all oh, out of those years gone by and that strange woman whom we knew and loved long dead and gone whose poor half-perished residue tombless and trod lay yon but at this moment to our view rose like a phantom wan and in his fixed face i could see lit by a lurid shine the drama reenact which she had died in carnadine for us and more and doubtless he beheld it too in mine a start as at one slightly known and with an indifferent air we passed without a sign being shown that as it real were a memory acted scene had thrown its tragic shadow there End of section 96. This recording is in the public domain. Section 97 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Death of Regret I opened my shutter at sunrise and looked at the hill hard by and I heartily grieved for the comrade who wandered up there to die. I let in the morn on the morrow, and failed not to think of him then, as he trod up that rise in the twilight, and never came down again. I undid the shutter a week thence, but not until after I turned did I call back his last departure by the upland there discerned. Uncovering the casement long later, I bent to my toil till the grey, when I said to myself, how oh, what ails me to forget him all the day? As daily I flung back the shutter in the same blank ball routine, he scarcely once rose to remembrance through a month of my facing the scene. And ah, seldom now do I ponder at the window as heretofore on the long-valued one who died yonder and wastes by the sycamore. End of section 97. This recording is in the public domain. Section 98 of Satires of Circumstance, 
Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. In the Days of the Crinoline. A plain tilt bonnet on her head, she took the path across the lees. Her spouse, the vicar, gardening, said, Too dowdy that for cockatrice, so I can hoe at ease. But when she had passed into the heath and gained the wood beyond the flat, she raised her skirts and from beneath unpinned and drew as from a sheath an ostrich feathered hat and where the hat had hung she now concealed and pinned the dowdy hood and set the hat upon her brow and thus emerging from the wood tripped on in jaunty mood the sun was low and crimson-faced as two came that way from the town and plunged into the wood untraced when separately therefrom they paced the sun had quite gone down the hat and feather disappeared the dowdy hood again was donned and in the gloom the fair one neared her home and husband dower who conned calmly his blue-eyed blonde to-day he said you have shown good sense a dress so modest and so meek should always stack your goings hence alone and as a recompense he kissed her on the cheek End of section 98. This recording is in the public domain. Section 99 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Roman Grave Mounds By Rome's dim relics there walks a man, eyes bent, and he carries a basket and spade, I guess what impels him to scrape and scan, yea, his dreams of that empire long decayed. Vast was Rome, he must muse, in the world's regard, vast it looms there still, vast it ever will be, and he stoops as to dig and unmind some shard left by those who are held in such memory. But no, in his basket, see, he has brought a little white furred thing, stiff of limb, whose life never won from the world a thought it is this and not rome that is moving him and to make it a grave he has come to the spot and he delves in the ancient dead's long home their fames their achievements the man knows not the third thing is all to him nothing rome here say you that caesar's warriors lie but my little white cat was my only friend could she but live might the record die of Caesar, his legions, his aims, his end? Well, Rome's long rule here is oft and again a theme for the sages of history, and the small furred life was worth no one's pen, yet its mourner's mood has a charm for me. November 1910 End of section 99 This recording is in the public domain. Section 100 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter And by Sonia The Workbox See, here's the workbox, little wife, that I made of polished oak. He was a joiner of village life. She came of borough folk. He holds the present up to her, as with a smile she nears, and answers to the profferer, "'Twill last all my sewing years." "'I warrant it will, and longer too. "'Tis a scantling that I got off poor John Wayward's coffin, "'who died of they knew not what. "'The shingled pattern that seems to cease against your box's rim "'continues right on in the piece that's underground with him. And while I worked it made me think of timber's very doom. One inch where people eat and drink, the next inch in a tomb. But why do you look so white, my dear, and turn aside your face? You knew not that good lad, I fear, though he came from your native place. How could I know that good young man 
though he came from my native town, when he must have left there earlier than I was a woman grown. Ah, no, I should have understood. It shocked you that I gave to you one end of a piece of wood, whose other is in a grave. Don't, dear, despise my intellect. Mere accidental things of that sort never have effect on my imaginings. Yet still her lips were limp and wan, her face still held aside, as if she had known not only John, but known of what he died. End of section 100. This recording is in the public domain. Section 101 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Sacrilege A Ballad Tragedy Circa 1820-something Part 1 I have a love I love too well Where Dunkery frowns on Exon Moor I have a love I love too well, To whom, if she was mine, Such is my love for you, I said, That you shall have to hood your head, A silken kerchief crimson red, Wo finest of the fine. And since this love, For one mad moon, On X and wild by Dunkery tore, Since this my love for one mad moon Did clasp me as her king, I snatched a silk piece red and rare From off a stall at pretty fair For handkerchief to hood her hair When we went gallanting. Full soon the four weeks neared their end Where Dunkery frowns on Exon Moor. And when the four weeks neared their end And their swift sweets outwore, I said, What shall I do to own those beauties Bright as tulips blown, and keep you here with me alone as mine for evermore. And as she drowsed within my van on Exon Wild by Dunkery Tor, and as she drowsed within my van, and dawning turned to day, she heavily raised her slow black eyes, and murmured back in softest wise, One more thing, and the charms you prize are yours henceforth for I. And swear I will I'll never go while Dunkery frowns on Exon Moor to meet the Cornish wrestler Joe for dance and dallyings. If you'll to yon cathedral shrine and finger from the chest divine treasure to buy me eardrops fine and richly jeweled rings. I said, I am one who has gathered gear from Marbury Downs to Dunkery Tor who has gathered gear for many a year, from mansion, mart, and fair. But at God's house I have stayed my hand, hearing within me some command, curbed by a law not of the land, from doing damage there. Whereat she pouts, this love of mine, as Dunkery frowns on Exon Moor, and still she pouts this love of mine, so cityward I go, but ere I start to do the thing, And speed my soul's imperiling, For one who is my ravishing, And all the joy I know, I come to lay this charge on thee, On Exon Wild by Dunkery Tor, I come to lay this charge on thee With solemn speech and sign. Should things go ill, And my life pay for botchery In this rash essay, You are to take hers likewise, Yea, the month the law takes mine. For should my rival, wrestler Joe, Where Dunkery frowns on Exon Moor, My reckless rival, wrestler Joe, My love's possessor be, My tortured spirit would not rest, But wander weary and distressed, Throughout the world in wild protest, The thought nigh maddens me. Part Two Thus did he speak, this brother of mine, on Exon Wild by Dunkery Tor, born at my birth of mother of mine, and forthwith went his way to dare the deed some coming night. I kept the watch with shaking sight, 
the moon at moments breaking bright, at others glooming grey. For three full days I heard no sound, where Dunkery frowns on Exon Moor. I heard no sound at all around, whether his fay prevailed, or one malign the master were, till some afoot did tidings bear, how that, for all his practised care, he had been caught and jailed. They had heard a crash when twelve had chimed by Mendip east of Dunkery Tor. When twelve had chimed and moonlight climbed, they watched, and he was tracked by arch and aisle and saint and knight of sculptured stonework sheeted white in the cathedral's ghostly light, and captured in the act. Yes, for this love he loved too well where Dunkery sights the severn shore. All for this love he loved too well, he burst the holy bars, seized golden vessels from the chest to buy her ornaments of the best, at her ill witchery's request and lure of eyes like stars. When blustering March confused the sky in Tomborough town by Exon Moor, when blustering March confused the sky, they stretched him, and he died. Down in the crowd where I, to see the end of him, stood silently, with a set face he lipped to me. Remember, I, I cried. By night and day I shadowed her, from Tonborough Dean to Dunkery Tor. I shadowed her asleep, astir, and yet I could not bear. Till wrestler Joe anon began to figure as her chosen man, and took her to a shining van, to doom a form so fair. He made it handsome for her sake, and Dunkery smiled to Exon Moor. He made it handsome for her sake, painting it out and in. And on the door of apple green, a bright brass knocker soon was seen and window curtains white and clean for her to sit within. And all could see she clave to him, as cleaves a cloud to Dunkery Tor. Yea, all could see she clave to him, and every day I said, A pity it seems to part those two, that hourly grow to love more true. Yet she's the wanton woman who sent one to swing till dead. That blew to blazing all my hate, while Dunkery frowned on Exon Moor, and when the river swelled, her fate came to her pitilessly. I dogged her, crying, Across that plank they use as bridge to reach yon bank, a coat and hat lie limp and dank. Your goodmans can they be? She paled, and went, I close behind, and Exon frowned to Dunkery Tor. She went, and I came up behind, and tipped the plank that bore her, fleetly flitting across to I what such might bode. She slid her eye, and from the current came a cry, a gurgle, and no more. How that befell no mortal knew, from Marbury Downs to Exon Moor, no mortal knew that deed undo, but he who schemed the crime which night still covers. But in dream, those ropes of hair upon the stream he sees, and he will hear that scream until his judgment time. End of section 101. This recording is in the public domain. Section 102 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Abbey Mason, inventor of the perpendicular style of Gothic architecture. The new vamped abbey shaped apace in the 14th century of grace. The church which, at an after date, acquired cathedral rank and state panel and circumscribing wall of latest feature trim and tall rose round about the norman core in prouder post than theretofore encasing magically the old with parpent ashlars manifold the trowels rang out and tracery appeared where blanks had used to be men toiled for pleasure more than pay and all went smoothly day by day 
till in due course the transept part engrossed the master mason's art homecoming thence he tossed and turned throughout the night till the new sun burned what fearful visions have inspired these gain givings his wife inquired as if your tools were in your hand you have hammered fitted muttered planned you have thumbed as you were working hard i might have found me bruised and scarred what then's amiss what eating care looms nigh whereof i am unaware he answered not but churchward went viewing his drafts with discontent and fumbled there the livelong day till hollow-eyed he came away twas said the master mason's ill and all the abbey works stood still quoth abbot wigmore why oh why distress yourself you'll surely die the mason answered trouble torn this long voked style is quite outworn the upper arch mould know how serves to meet the lower tracery curves the ogies bend too far away to give the flexures interplay this it is causes my distress so it will ever be unless new forms be found to supersede the circle when occasions need to carry it out i have tried and toiled and now perforce must own me foiled jeerers will say here was a man who could not end what he began so passed that day the next the next the abbot scanned the task perplexed the townsmen mustered all their wit to fathom how to compass it but no raw artistries availed where practice in the craft had failed one night he tossed all open-eyed and early left his helpmeet side scattering the rushes of the floor he wandered from the chamber door and sought the sizing pile whereon struck dimly a cadaverous dawn through freezing rain that drenched the board of diagram lines he last had scored chalked fantasies in vain begot to knife the architectural knot in front of which he dully stood regarding them in hopeless mood he closelier looked then looked again the chalk scratched draught board faced the rain whose icicled drops deformed the lines innumerous of his lame designs so that they streamed in small white threads from the upper segments to the heads of arcs below uniting them each by a stalactitic stem at once with eyes that struck out sparks he adds accessory cusping marks then laughs aloud the thing was done so long assayed from sun to sun now in his joy he grew aware of one behind him standing there and turning saw the abbot who the weather swim was watching too onward to prime the abbot went tacit upon the incident men now discerned as days revolved the ogive riddle had been solved templates were cut fresh lines were chalked where lines had been defaced and balked and the work swelled and mounted higher achievement distancing desire here gems with transoms fixed between where never the like before had been there little mullions thinly sown where meeting circles once were drawn we knew man said the thing would go after his craft wit got a glow and once fulfilled what he has designed we'll honour him and his great mind when matters stood thus poised a while and all surroundings shed a smile the master mason on an eve home to his wife and seemed to grieve the abbot spoke to me to-day he hangs about the works all way he knows the source as well as i of the new style men magnify he said you pride yourself too much on your creation is it such surely the hand of god it is that conjured so and only his disclosing by the frost and rain forms your invention chased in vain hence the devices deemed so great you copied and did not create i feel the abbot's words are just and that all thanks renounce i must can a man welcome praise and pelf for hatching art that hatched itself so i shall own the deft design is heaven's outshaping and not mine what said she praise your works and sure to throw away and quite obscure your beaming and beneficent star better you leave things as they are why think a while had not your zest in your loved craft curtailed your rest had you not gone there ere the day the sun had melted all away but though his good wife argued so the mason let the people know that not unaided sprang the thought 
whereby the glorious fane was wrought but that by frost when dawn was dim the method was disclosed to him yet said the townspeople thereat tis your own doing even with that but he chafed childlike in extremes the temperament of men of dreams aloofly scrupled to admit that he did aught but borrow it and diffidently made request that with the abbot all should rest as none could doubt the abbot's word or question what the church averred the mason was at length believed of no more count than he conceived and soon began to lose the fame that late had gathered round his name time passed and like a living thing the pile went on embodying and workmen died and young ones grew and the old mason sank from view and abbot swigmore and staunton went and horton sped the embellishment but not till years had far progressed chanced it that one day much impressed standing within the well-graced aisle he asked who first conceived the style and some decrepit sage detailed how when invention naught availed the cloud-cast waters in their whim came down and gave the hint to him who struck each arc and made each mould and how the abbot would not hold as sole begetter him who applied forms the almighty sent as guide and how the master lost renown and wore in death no artist crown then horton who in inner thought had more perceptions than he taught replied nay art can but transmute invention is not absolute things fail to spring from naught at call and art beginnings most of all he did but what all artists do wait upon nature for his cue had you been here to tell them so lord abbot sixty years ago the mason now long underground doubtless a different fate had found he passed into oblivion dim and none knew what became of him his name twas of some common kind and now has faded out of mind the abbot it shall not be hid i'll trace it but he never did when longer yet dank death had wormed the brain wherein the style had germed from gloucester church it flew afar the style called perpendicular to winton and to westminster it ranged and grew still beautifuller from solvay frith to dover strand its fascinations start the land not only on cathedral walls but upon courts and castle halls till every edifice in the isle was patterned to no other style and till long having played its part the curtain fell on gothic art well when in wessex on your rounds take a brief step beyond its bounds and enter gloucester seek the coin where choir and transept interjoin and gazing at the forms there flung against the sky by one unsung the ogee arches transom topped the tracery stalks by spandrels stopped petrified lacework lightly lined on ancient massiveness behind muse that some minds so modest be as to renounce fame's fairest fee like him who crystallized on this spot his visionings but lies forgot and many a medieval one whose symmetries salute the sun while others boom a baseless claim and upon nothing rare a name end of section one hundred and two this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and three of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Jubilee of a Magazine to the Editor Yes, your updated modern page, all flower fresh as it appears, can claim a time tried lineage that reaches backward fifty years, which, if but short for sleeping squires, is much in magazines' careers. Here on your cover never tires the sower, reaper, thresher, while as through the seasons of our sires each wills to work in ancient style with seed-lip sickle share and flail though modes have since moved many a mile the steel-robed plough now rips the veil with cog and tooth the sheaves are won wired wheels drum out the wheat like hail but if we ask what has been done to unify the mortal lot since your bright leaves first saw the sun beyond mechanic furtherance 
what advance can rightness candor claim truth bends abashed and answers not despite your volume's gentle aim to straighten visions wry and wrong events jar onward much the same had custom tended to prolong as on your golden page ingrained old processes of blade and prong and best invention been retained for high crusades to lessen tears throughout the race the world had gained but too much this for fifty years end of section one hundred and three this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and four of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy read for librivox dot org by sonia the satin shoes if ever i walk to church to wed as other maidens use and face the gathered eyes she said i'll go in satin shoes she was as fair as early day shining on meads unmown and her sweet syllables seemed to play like flute notes softly blown the time arrived when it was meet that she should be a bride the satin shoes were on her feet her father was at her side they stood within the dairy door and gazed across the green the church loomed on the distant moor but rain was thick between the grass path hardly can be stepped the lane is like a pool her dream is shown to be inept her wish they overrule to go forth shod in satin soft a coach would be required for thickest boots the shoes were doffed those shoes her soul desired all day the bride as overborne was seen to brood apart and that the shoes had not been worn sat heavy on her heart from her wrecked dream as month flew on her thoughts seemed not to range what ails the wife they said anon that she should be so strange ah what coach comes with furtive glide a coach of closed-up kind it comes to fetch the last year's bride who wanders in her mind she strove with them and fearfully ran stairward with one low scream nay coax her said the madhouse man with some old household theme if you will go dear you must fain put on those shoes the pair meant for your marriage which the rain forbade you then to wear she clapped her hands flushed joyous hues oh yes i'll up and ride if i am to wear my satin shoes and be a proper bride out then her little foot held she as to depart with speed the madhouse man smiled pleasantly to see the wild succeed she turned to him when all was done and gave him her thin hand exclaiming like an enraptured one this time it will be grand she mounted with a face elate shut was the carriage door they drove her to the madhouse gate and she was seen no more yet she was fair as early day shining on meads unmown and her sweet syllables seemed to play like flute notes softly blown end of section 104 this recording is in the public domain section 105 of satires of circumstance lyrics and reveries with miscellaneous pieces by thomas hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Exeunt Omnes. One. Everybody else then going, and I still left where the fair was. Much have I seen of neighbor loungers making a lusty showing, each now past all knowing. Two. There is an air of blankness in the street and the littered spaces. Thoroughfare, steeple bridge and highway wisen themselves to lankness kennels dribble dankness three folk all fade and whither as i wait alone where the fair was into the clammy and numbing night fog whence they entered hither soon do i follow thither june 2nd nineteen thirteen End of section 105. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 106 of Satires of Circumstance, Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. A Poet Attentive eyes, fantastic heed, Assessing minds he does not need, Nor urgent writs to sup or dine, Nor pledges in the roseate wine. For loud acclaim he does not care, By the august or rich or fair, nor for smart pilgrims from afar, curious on where his hauntings are. But soon or later, when you hear that he has doffed this wrinkled gear, some evening at the first star ray, come to his graveside, pause and say. Whatever the message his to tell, two bright-souled women loved him well. Stand and say that amid the dim, it will be praise enough for him. July 1914 End of section 106. This recording is in the public domain. Section 107 of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Postscript Men Who March Away. Song of the Soldiers. What of the faith and fire within us, men who march away, ere the barncocks say, night is growing grey, to hazards whence no tears can win us? What of the faith and fire within us, men who march away? Is it a pure blind prank, O oh, think you, friend with the musing eye, who watches stepping by with doubt and dolorous sigh? Can much pondering so hoodwink you? Is it a pure blind prank, go oh, think you, friend with the musing eye? Nay, we well see what we are doing, though some may not see, dalliers as they be. England's need are we, her distress would leave us ruing. Nay, we well see what we are doing, though some may not see. In our heart of hearts believing, victory crowns the just, And that braggarts must surely bite the dust. Press we to the field ungrieving, In our heart of hearts believing, victory crowns the just. Hence the faith and fire within us, men who march away, Ere the barncocks say night is growing grey, To hazards whence no tears can win us. Hence the faith and fire within us, men who march away. September 5th, 1914 End of section 107 This recording is in the public domain. End of Satires of Circumstance Lyrics and Reveries with Miscellaneous Pieces by Thomas Hardy